Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 10th meeting of the Audit Committee. As we have quorum present, I call this meeting to order. Are there any declarations of interest? Please indicate the item number and the nature of the interest. Seeing none, I will now take a motion to confirm the minutes from June 27th, 2017. Councillor Matlow, all those in favor? And that is carried. We'll now go through the items. <coughs> I'll ask members to identify anything you want to hold. I do think we have a number of presentation and we have a few speakers listed. So the first item is AU 10.1 election of vice chair for the remainder of the 2017 and 2018 audit committee. Um, we do, it's being held for a speaker. AU 10.2, a review of Municipal Licensing and Standards Division's Management of Business Licenses Part 1 License Issuance Inspection and Complaint Investigation Functions. This is being held, uh, well, be held in my name for a presentation. And in fact, we have presentations on the subsequent two items. Councillor Palacio, did you? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Yes, on the point of order is we have those three items, two, three, and four. If it would be possible, maybe just to deal with those three items as they're very related to each other. Uh, my thinking as well, so I'll put that question to members of the committee. Depending on how many questions you have, if you feel it's more efficient, we can hear them as a single item. Is that the consent of everybody? Great, we'll do so, and we'll make sure that we get any questions answered. Thank you. AU 10.3. This is a review of Municipal Licensing and Standards Division's Management of Business Licenses Part 2, Licensed Holistic Centres. Again, uh, a presentation on that item. AU 10.4, a review of Municipal Licensing and Standards Division's Management of Business Licenses Part 3, Eating Establishments and Nightclubs. That is held in my name as there is a presentation. AU 10.5, Toronto Building Division, conditional permits. Uh, that is being held for a presentation in my name. AU 10.6, Auditor General's Office 2018 Operating Budget. That is also held in my name for a presentation. AU 10.7, 2018 Audit Work Plan. Like to hold that, please. Councillor Matlow, you want to hold that? Yes, please. Okay. AU 10.8, obtaining the best value through the use of vendor rosters. <coughs> Any interest in hold? Would somebody like to? Would somebody like to move that, please? Councillor Carmichael Greb. <coughs> All those in favor of adopting the recommendations? <coughs> that is carried. Got one item down. AU 10.9, improving the effectiveness of the basement flooding protection subsidy program. Are there any holds for that? Great, would somebody like to move that please? Councillor Ford. All those in favor? That is carried. AU 10.10, .10, Auditor General's observations on the quantity of product realized from the city's single stream recyclable material blue bin program. Are there any questions on that? Uh, would somebody like to move the recommendations? Councillor Matlow. All those in favor? That is carried. AU 10.11. 10 I'd like you to hold that, please. Councillor Matlow. Uh, I'll just read that out for uh, the benefit of process. Auditor General's Office. Review of complaint regarding the June 29, 2016 Toronto Transit Commission briefing note. And we do have speakers on that. There's an 11A. AU 10.12, Auditor General's 2017 Status Report on Outstanding Audit Recommendations, City Divisions and Cluster C. 
Are there any questions? Would somebody like to move the recommendations? Councilor Ford, I got your, uh, your hand first. All those in favor? That is carried. AU 10.13, Auditor General's Office Forensic Unit Status Report on Outstanding Recommendations. Are there any uh, desires to hold? Seeing none, would somebody like to move that? Councillor Lee. All those in favour? That is carried. AU 10.14, Auditor General's 2017 Consolidated Status Report on Follow-up of Outstanding Audit Recommendations. Are there any questions on that item? Seeing none, would somebody like to move the recommendations? Councillor Carmichael Greb. All those in favour? That is carried. AU 10.15, process to obtain external audit services 2018 to 2022 inclusive. Are there any desires for a hold on that? Seeing none, would somebody like to move the receipt for information? Councillor Lee. All those in favour? That is carried. AU 10.16, 2016, audited financial statements of business improvement areas. Report number two, any desires for a hold? Seeing none, would somebody like to move the recommendations? Councillor Lee. All those in favour? That is carried. AU 10.17, financial statements for the year ended December 31st, 2016, agencies and corporations. Are there any holds on any of the sub-items? Councillor Lee? Okay, I think we have to go through these one by one. No, no, oh. So if there's no holds, we can take them as a package. Um, Councillor Lee, did you want to move the, the recommendations? Thank you, Councillor Lee. All those in favour? And those are all carried. AU 10.19, review of the Toronto train. Pardon me. AU 10.18, City of Toronto audit plan for the year ending December 31st, 2017. This is a receipt for information. Are there any questions on this? Would somebody like to move receipt? Councillor Matlow. All those in favour? That's carried. AU 10.19, review of Toronto Transit Commission accounts payable functions, improving invoice verification and vendor account management. Are there any? Uh, no. Councillor Ford? Hold that. I think we have one last one. AU 10.20. Um, this is the supplier code of conduct. Are there any questions? Seeing none, would somebody like to move this uh, receipt for information? Councillor Lee, I saw your hand first. All those in favour? None is carried. Okay, we'll go to our first item, which is AU 10.1. We do have a speaker on this item, and that is Derek Moran. Good morning and welcome. You have five minutes. I just want to say by me speaking at this meeting, this shall not be deemed to be in any way my consent expressed or implied in doing so as fraud. God bless Her Majesty the Queen and long live Her Majesty the Queen. Now, just in case Councillor Michael Ford over here is chosen as the Vice Chair of the Audit Committee, I want him to take notice then of Mayor Tory's code of conduct he came up with when he was running against his Uncle Rob, especially number nine of it, which it says, I will introduce real penalties for elected officials and public servants who abuse the privileges, responsibilities, and trust that accompany public service. We work for Torontonians, not the other way around. And um, now anyone here actually know what those real penalties were that Mayor Tory came up with? Because he hasn't actually got around to doing that yet. So it's been one year, two year, three years. Like it's been three years. So if Councillor Ford here is chosen as vice chair, and I have a feeling that he won't mind doing this, considering the intense scrutiny his Uncle Rob faced here as mayor on a daily basis, holding Mayor Tory's feet to the fire and finally getting around to resolving number nine of his code of conduct, you know, before the next election in less than a year. Mayor Tory had introduced these real penalties 
maybe that would have served as a better deterrent over the past three years. To those who think it's okay to pay with our money for land more than it's worth or reporting on any suspected bid rig contracts rather than falling asleep at the switch over it. <clears throat> so the last time I was here about this, I think I referred to uh, the councillor from my area, councillor Kristen Carmichael Greb here as the libertarian councillor here for the city of Toronto. And just in case anyone's wondering, I'm here to demand that councillor Greb be made the vice chair of the audit committee here in I'd say about three minutes. I just wanted to go over some of the libertarian stances she has taken since becoming a councillor here at the City of Toronto, and why because of this common sense approach of hers, uh, mindset, why she would best serve the people of Toronto as being the next vice chair here. Number one, basically, <clears throat> who are we to tell these people, kids in this place, that they can't play street ball hockey? Two, and my favourite, uh, I'm not aware of any detrimental effects from any secondhand energy drink drinking, so who are we to tell these people that they can't drink energy drinks? Three, who are we to tell these people that they can't have a driveway to park their car on their own property? Because remember, Constitution starts off about the supremacy of God, and Genesis 1.26 says that we were given dominion, have dominion over all of this, so we should be able to park our car on our own property. And uh, four, who are we to tell these people that they can't have a little library on their front lawn? And I'm almost certain that once she becomes the vice chair of the audit committee here, then she will be able to add number five to her list, which is, who is Rob Rossini and Mike St. Amant to tell Derek that his dad can't use the remittance that we provide to discharge any public debt from the city of Toronto with? Well, that was Rob Rossini, he's gone now. By the way, at the police board yesterday, Councillor Lee could probably vouch for me, just so you all know, I did a freedom of information request, and it turned out, uh, signed here by Yuli Wakis at the bottom here, oh, Rob Rossini never took his subscribed oath to the Queen pursuant to Section 4 of the Public Officers Act. Isn't that something? Huh. I just wanted to share that with everybody. So, um, yeah, I was kind of stunned that she wasn't chosen the last time I was here, though. So uh, I guess I just didn't know the criteria of what goes into being chosen for Vice Chair of the Audit Committee. So I was wondering um, if you guys could just fill me in. What, what exactly are the cre criteria that goes into choosing someone here for a uh, vice chair for the audit committee? The procedure doesn't permit a question of the committee. Um, I'm hoping that was a rhetorical question to allow us to think. <laughs> no, you know, I come to think of it, you mentioned that to me in March and it's, I've actually seen on the City of Toronto's website where it says that you council members can ask questions of us, but I have never seen on the City of Toronto's website any record document where it says we can't ask you people questions. Councillor Holliday, you seem like a, a fair, impartial, upstanding guy. If I did a freedom of information request with the city clerk's office to find out just where it says that, would that be fair? And if I came here next time and said that with a result that Yuliak was Yuli Walk has found that nowhere does it say that. Would it be fair to say that we could ask questions of you people in the future? Thank you for speaking to us. Because I've actually done that and they've denied that request. I just want to point that out to everybody. To be, to be helpful, uh, I wondered if you would consider uh, writing to your counselor with a question and there may be an efficient way to find an answer. Um, with that, um, are there any members of the committee or uh, visiting councillors that wish to pose a question? Seeing none, okay, thank you. All right, um, I guess we will, I will now call for nominations. Uh, pardon me, um, I think uh, just on a point of privilege, um, we're gonna vary the process just a little bit. I wanted to make a quick statement to um, thank Councillor Lee uh, for service as Vice Chair and uh, uh, for service um, uh, as Chair previous um, and for the, um, the teaching and mentorship you, uh, you offered this new Councillor and, and able to, um, in, to equip me to fulfill this role and I want to say I think the committee was well served as were the citizens of this city. And I would invite any other, anyone else around the table that wanted to make a statement. 
Audit, Madam Auditor? Yes, on behalf of uh, my entire office, I sincerely wish to thank you for all of the mentorship, um, your wisdom. I didn't actually know anybody when I arrived in Toronto and you were one of the first people that I've met and your leadership and wisdom has been tremendous and we all look up to you. So thank you and we know where you are if we have a question. We do. Thank you, but uh, you're all good to work with, so it makes my job easier. So, and uh, with that, I'd like to nominate uh, Councillor Carmichael Grapp to be Vice Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, uh, we do not need to have an election. So the clerk's gonna advise me on the, the correct process here. Councillor Carmichael Grab, I just want to confirm that you would accept uh, the nomination and you wish your name to stand. Yes, I do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm advised by the clerk that we are now on to item 10.2, a review of municipal licensing and standard divisions, management of business licenses, part one, license issuance, inspection and complaint investigation functions, and as we discussed in the meeting, we are gonna bind that together with, uh, I will read out the title here, AU 10.3, a review of municipal licensing and standards divisions, management of business licenses, part two, licensed holistic centers, and AU 10.4, a review of municipal licensing and standards divisions, management of business licenses, part three, eating establishments and nightclubs. Uh, Madam Auditor and uh, I believe, Jane, you have a presentation for the committee, and I welcome you to start that as soon as you're ready. Ah, just hang on a sec here. We're just gonna get something sorted out. Councillor Ford, did you have an issue with the microphone? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, can, can everyone hear me? All right, my light's not. Right. Just on a point of order, um, I'd just like to preface my comments with, uh, you know, the Honor General does a phenomenal job and her team. Um, however, it, it is very difficult to be reviewing the agenda when we received the supplemental <coughs> materials two days before uh, committee. Um, so uh, I'd just like to make staff cognizant that uh, it's a little difficult to prepare for audit with such a short timeline. Thank you for that statement, Councillor Ford. I Take it, everyone will duly note that and appreciate it. Uh, thank you, and uh, um, to you, Councillor, you're absolutely correct, and we uh, take that under advisement, and we're ready to move forward. So um, thank you for um, allowing us to present on this item, uh, Chair. Uh, before I commence, though, I'd like to just give a, a quick, um, uh, uh, just a, a quick context um, municipal licensing is an area that touches all of our lives. And it's an area that many people are very passionate about. And we have performed our audit and we have three reports. The first one being on really the overall process. The second one related to a couple of examples which help to highlight areas for improvement. But at the higher level, it is a very complex area. Um, uh, Ms. Cook and her team uh, have a number of initiatives underway, uh, quite a few. And I'm hoping that this audit allows the opportunity just to take a step back and to look at the process from end to end to see if we can have an integra a more integrated approach. There's things that are working well and there's things that need improvement. And uh, it's not going to be a simple fix and it's not going to be overnight but if they are important areas and it's important that we um, allow that to happen. So with that introduction, I'd like to start with the first report. And the first report is really on process. And before I start, I'd like to introduce um, uh, my uh, Assistant Auditor General, Jane Ying, and the team, um, Richir Patel and uh, Sean Sell. And uh, by way of background, um, the division is responsible for regulating 
businesses across the city and myriad of bylaws. And it includes, um, the purpose is to make sure that uh, public health and safety are met, um, consumer protection uh, is in place, and uh, nuisance control. So the city, design, the city um, council directs that a bylaw be developed, legal develops it, and it's really to help to regulate these three areas. Our objective was to, to assess the effectiveness and the efficiency of the licensing functions. And so we took the last two years of licensing data, and to give you a, a, a perspective, there's 87,000 licenses um, issued or renewed in 2016, and uh, 28.9 million comes from really licensing fees. So it's a quite a large area, it's quite a big responsibility. <coughs> and then, <coughs> excuse me. We, um, our review conducted it in three areas. As I mentioned, we have a systemic overview. We look at the entire system. There's opportunities for improvement. There's opportunities for, to look at transformation from a holistic level. There's areas that are being transformed, but we wanted to take a step back and really make sure everything is synchronized. Part two relates to the enforcement activities related to holistic centers, and part three relates to the operating of uh, potentially unlicensed nightclubs. Part two and part three, um, they can all be fixed if we fix part one. So, but they're just examples to highlight individual areas that were identified by MLS themselves, also by the licensing committee as areas that needed to be improved. Our added value is we, we really get in and try to dissect where some of the problem areas were and that we hope to help the MLS team. So MLS does a, a great job in their upfront process. Um, uh, Annalise and her team are looking at making sure that the processing of the applications is correct. And sometimes there's clearance inspections that have to happen even before somebody is licensed. And they do a great job there. And we did find that the staff were generally well versed in the bylaw requirements and uh, the staff on the ground were also. So that's a great starting platform. And now, with the rest of the system, um, that's what we'll talk about in this presentation. Jane, you may add anything you would like, if you have anything you'd like to add. So, um, part one, issuing license, license issuing inspection and uh, complaint investigation functions. We did find businesses operating without a valid license. And this is not new for MLS. They understand and they have identified, actually there's about 900 businesses that they had identified that were operating without a license and about 50% of those, um, we have it in the stats in our, in our um, audit report. Many of those they were able to get licensed. But the challenge here is that um, the businesses can continue to operate and we asked, our recommendation was to really review the enforcement framework to see if there are any other tools that could be leveraged to deal with businesses that are operating and are unlicensed. If a business is licensed and there's something that happens, if there's measures you can take them to a tribunal, there are things you can do, it might be a little more challenging when you're dealing with an unlicensed business. So our theme today is not to solve the issue at the table, but to allow the city to take it away and see what they can do with their expertise to come up with um, more and better enforcement measures. Um, proactive inspection. This is, there's two types of inspection. One is proactively um, going out just to you know, verify that compliance is happening. And then there's um, uh, inspections that are a result of a complaint. And in the proactive inspection, we found that they were being done, but the information around that was um, uh, more, um, it could be improved. We noticed, for example, 30% of the establishments um, had no inspections for three years or more. And why that's important is, is to take a risk-based approach and understanding what coverage you have. I guess from an audit perspective, we want to, we do a risk-based approach and we understand how much effort we have to put in different areas. And it might be okay to have 30% of the establishments, the eating establishments, food stores and hair salons, not having inspection. But it's really to use the information that you have to identify the coverage you first need and then that you're actually getting. The, there's no requirement for inspection frequency, uh, there's no alert in the system to flag if a business hadn't been inspected. And we had some businesses having more than 
10 inspections in a year while others had none and, and it wasn't necessarily because of a complaint. And so we're saying a coordinated effort, a risk-based approach is there and actually management is doing a, an, uh, working on a system of uh, inspection analysis uh, and, and, and that's, that's great. Um, management agrees with our recommendations in all of these areas and uh, we'll be taking it away and uh, factoring it into um, um, uh, any improvements from a transformation perspective. Around the investigation requests, um, what we noticed was that uh, same, similar kind of um, uh, finding, we noticed that uh, there's hours spent on investigations and you know, we, you can't always predict the amount of hours that something's going to take. We understand that. But in order to plan for resources, you ha it's important to understand the kinds of things that will come up and where, you're, where the time is being spent. And uh, this is an opportunity uh, to track and review and monitor efficiency of staff handling complaints. They do us, um, um, MLS has KPIs. They have performance measures that they um, are trying to meet. I think two day turnaround for inspection uh, response and then within seven days of closure, making sure the report gets through. But the challenge is, um, the tracking of that is not there, and I understand that they're working on some management information systems, but we thought it important to coordinate that with the, the work from this overall audit to make sure the right questions are being answered. So this isn't a criticism, but, uh, we, but it's an observation, um, and uh, more information is needed to uh, be able to verify that um, the uh, complaints are being addressed uh, effectively. On average, it takes 53 days to close an inspection request. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a while, but it might be it's, a, it's, it's inspected but not closed on paper. So there's, there's may, maybe many reasons, and it's really for MLS to take away and be pro um, provide um, better information for senior management. We also noted that in, in different areas of the city, there's central, east, and west, and the central area had um, about 2,200 um, investigation requests uh, and, uh, in a year, and uh, there's 13 staff, where other areas had you know, my, many few, like fewer investigation requests, and um, they had uh, you know, almost an equal amount of staff. So there's things to rationalize there. Jane, is there anything you'd like to add? Or? No, you're good. So this slide, I think, is for me probably the most important theme across all of these reports. In order for MLS to be able to operate um, efficiently and effectively, um, they need to have clear, specific, enforceable bylaws. This comes from um, actually the audit, the Ombudsman um, for BC, um, former Queen's Council, uh, Head of Justice Services in BC, he has a best practice report that I, I think that MLS and, um, and, and uh, other related divisions will be leveraging around um, best practices around bylaw enforcement. Having a clear law allows um, staff to go out and to understand the test that has to be met um, and, and really look for, um, think about the kinds of evidence they can collect so that it can be done efficiently. Um, the ability to enforce is important. Um, what we found was the law wasn't clear so we could understand some of the challenges that were being faced by the MLS division. So they're trying to enforce something that might not be as clear. And the last area is investigation strategy. S understanding, uh, especially for complex matters, how long it could take, the nature of the evidence that would be required, um, is important. Every officer has the discretion to decide on their investigation approach, but generally there are common things that should be looked for. They'll start with the bylaw, understanding the bylaw, understanding the test, understanding the type of evidence they need, and when they go out they can make it the discretion to do more or less. But that helps to guide their approach to make sure that they get what they need for prosecution and for um, to make sure fairness is applied across the board. Administrative fairness is important throughout this. Um, so in having an investigation plan for complex matters, that's a best practice, uh, but officers still need to use their discretion. And uh, that's, so overall in the first area, what we're recommending actually is uh, based on some of this and other things we saw. For example, 
um, there, uh, there's an app that's available that officers were trying to use, and we found on average over 10 weeks, there was about 38 times officers tried to get into the app, and, and it wasn't working as well, and MLS already knows that. Uh, what we're recommending is some technological solutions, but technological solutions and some more staff on the ground won't fix some of these upfront parts, so we want to make sure that it's a holistic look from end to end. So that's the first part, um, and Jane, you can speak in relation to um, the enforcement of holistic centers as one example of an area that uh, where there has to be more clarity, where there should be more clarity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to move on to uh, part two, just a few slides to uh, give you an open view of what's, uh, what we found. So this table gives you a very high level comparison um, of the differences between a holistic, a licensed holistic center and a licensed uh, body work parlor. So uh, holistic services, the definition is uh, for therapeutic and wellness purposes, whereas body work uh, services is includes so many things and touching, stimulating, and by means of like a body um, there are currently 410 licensed uh, holistic centers there, no cap, whereas for body rock parlors, uh, city has a cap, uh, only uh, 25 uh, licenses. The licensing fees are also very different. Uh, so holistic centers, about $200, uh, $300 for uh, initial license fee, whereas a uh, body rock parlors is 13,000 for initials and then 12,000 annual renewal. Um, for people, workers who at the uh, body rock parlors, they have to undergo um, rigorous uh, health examinations and to make sure they're free from communicable diseases and medically fit to work. Um, whereas uh, this requirement is not uh, applicable for the holistic uh, license. However, holistic uh, petitioners, I have to emphasize, they are licensed. Everybody who work at a holistic center, they, are called, they, are, they have to be licensed by MLS. They hold a holistic petitioner license. And there are about over, uh, just over 2,000 of them uh, right now have this uh, holistic petitioner license. Um, one of the difference we notice in the bio, of course, we're not going, these are just some key differences. Uh, one of the differences we know in the bylaw is uh, for holistic center, the treatment room, the door to the treatment room, they can lock it uh, for privacy reasons, right, if they're working on a client. Whereas in a, a body rock parlor place, uh, they are not allowed to lock the treatment rooms in case an, uh, a bylaw officer needs to go in and check it. Um, so what we found was um, a number of the licensed holistic centers appear to be offering unauthorized services. So of the 410 licensed uh, holistic centers, we did a website search and we matched the results to the MLS license to make sure they are licensed as the holistic center. We found one. 107 of them appear to be offering unauthorized services. Um, so why we say that is we look at the uh, website advertisements, they contain explicit uh, sexual uh, photograph and language and uh, also they provide services such as uh, erotic massage and much more. Um, 13, and when we look at the uh, enforcement history from MLS, actually 37 of them uh, were charged by MLS uh, over the last two years, 2005, 2016, and there were quite a few charges, like uh, over, like total 117 charges for various uh, bylaw uh, in, uh, violation, and one center was charged for operating as an unlicensed uh, body work parlor, and the rest of the charges will be like uh, remaining open after hour, they're supposed to be closed by nine, and also uh, permitting unlicensed petitioners to work in the centers. So at the end of our audit, we, um, at our request, uh, we, um, MLS provided us a list of over 100 uh, holistic centers that they think are problematic. Just before you move on, um, in this uh, area, 
we're discussing, we've shown um, body rub, um, um, an outline, compare the two. We're not suggesting that uh, the holistics are operating as a body rub shop. What we're suggesting is that what, from what we've seen, the services are unauthorized services. And it is an area that where if a bylaw officer is trying to enforce or if the legal is trying to prosecute, um, it's challenging and being clear on what um, the city um, wants in this area and the, and the direction and the, the tests is really important and it's a policy area that would take um, time to uh, make sure that you develop, but it's an important area. So it's so important to be clear so that if enforcement is going to happen, it's going to happen in a cost-effective manner. Thank you. So um, as I mentioned before, there are all the holistic petitioners, they have to be licensed. The, our bylaw also asks these holistic petitioners to be a member of the city approved PHA. PHA is Professional Holistic Association. Um, so these, um, there are right now 37 city approved PHA. They are in the bylaw, they are attached as uh, the names are all there. Um, so this PH8 um, requirement was added to the bylaw in 2005, following staff re a staff report and the staff recommendations. So the intent of this uh, city p setting up this PH8 was for the city to rely on this accredited um, PH8 to govern their members. Those those will be the licensed holistic petitioners to ensure integrity and honesty of their services. So these PHA, they also, uh, they charge their members a membership fee. Um, it can range from over $1,000 for initial membership fee per person and to up to like $500 per year. So by our estimate, uh, they could collect up to uh, over uh, $250,000 from initial membership fee or, and also $100,000 per year from renewal fee. Mm -hmm. So at a high level, we require um, uh, practitioners to, um, to register with these associations. And we've outlined in a table a great deal of concerns we have with that. Uh, so it's, we recommend the city take that away and really look at that area and see if those associations are serving the needs that we need as a city to make sure this area is, um, operates appropriately. So I'm just uh, going to give a little bit more detail following um, um, Auditor General's uh, um, the, the comments. So although there, as I said, there are 37 approved city approved PHA, but 92% of all the licensed petitioners belong to 10 big PHA, large PHA. So we undertook a review of these 10 PHA. What we found was um, what appeared on paper is very different from what uh, actually happened. Uh, most, some of them, uh, they don't have a, a commercial address. They work out of like a residential address. They uh, work out of an, an abandoned building or a cottage or a PO box. Uh, more concerning, uh, we found um, uh, one of the PHA director was actually uh, convicted for an assault under criminal code and also uh, convicted for operating an unlicensed body wrap parlor. Two other uh, PHA directors was, were also convicted for operating unlicensed body wrap parlors. Another director was uh, being prosecuted for illegally uh, practicing massage therapy. So um, we believe the problem really um, is with the bylaw. The bylaw does not give MLS the proper tool to enforce, to regulate PHA. So MLS has no authority to conduct any background check on the PHA directors when they are uh, approved their, their initial, they're doing the initial approval. In our view, um, it's the initial approval is more or less a, like a paper exercise and looking at all the paper they supply and they have the policy and procedures. Also, there's no bylaw uh, provision to allow MLS to conduct inspection of this PHA after they approve them. So they can never go in to check them out. Uh, and also, uh, even uh, to us, it's 
even worse is even when P, uh, MLS found certain PHA to be problematic, and in our discussion with them, they do acknowledge they, they are aware some PHA are problematic. There is no bylaw provision to allow MLS to revoke their approval uh, status or to recognize the, P, uh, the, the um, members that belongs to these uh, problematic PHA. Um, we have to remember, because PHA is not a license, right, it's an approval status, so they are not under the jurisdiction of the licensing tribunal. So licensing tribunal cannot, like, revoke their license or something, because it's not a license status. So in 2013 and 2014, uh, uh, MLS uh, conducted a review of this whole area and consultation with PHA operators and um, subsequently they released a uh, public uh, presentation. Uh, in the presentation, they, they also uh, indicate that majority of the individual who will issue a holistic center or holistic petitioner license are offering body rub services. So a staff report was uh, to be submitted back to licensing and uh, standards committee on how to better manage the whole set of PHA. Uh, uh, today, uh, our report has not been submitted. So uh, we really, what we recommend is to re as reassess the merits and practicality of the city relying on PHA as governing, uh, governing bodies and to undertake a comprehensive review of the existing bylaw and legislative framework governing this whole area. And I think um, um, MLS was um, uh, in agreement to that. Okay. So part three relates to licensing, um, uh, licensed eating establishments that may potentially be operating as unlicensed nightclubs. One of the things that the Ombudsman for British Columbia brought out in his bylaw best practices is that things evolve. And when industries evolve, bylaws need to evolve with it. And this is an area where the industry seems to have evolved and demographics have evolved. So um, it's important to take a look at this. Over the years, we've noticed some councillors raising um, an issue, uh, a question in this area where there's a, a licensed eating establishment uh, that appears to be operating as a nightclub. And a lot of times it comes out of noise complaints and that kind of thing. So if we look at the differences between an eating establishment and a nightclub, what we see is that there's uh, you know, 7,900 eating establishments and, and 39 licensed nightclubs. And we can see, um, unlike the uh, holistic and body rub, these license fees are very similar. But where the challenge comes is in the uh, increase in regulation around nightclubs. Nightclubs have to be in a specially zoned area. There's, they have to have noise and crowd control plans. They have to have a security guard for every 100 patrons, metal detectors at the exits. Uh, they have to have comprehensive insurance. Uh, they have to be located on, this, on the first story. So if you have a nightclub that's operating in the basement, that's not in accordance with the bylaws that are in place. Um, you're only allowed one nightclub per building, and uh, it's restricted in certain areas. So. Um, what we, what we have noticed just through our research and also in speaking with MLS is that something may be a, a needing establishment in the day, but actually in the evening there might be um, a nightclub transformation and you actually get a nightclub happening. So making sure that you have bylaws to be able to deal with this is it's, it's important because obviously from these two comparisons you can see that the city Council has put emphasis on nightclubs to have them regulated in a certain form. Thank you. So um, what we did um, for this art, uh, area is um, we actually started with MLS uh, licensing database and we use a keyword search. We search the words um, within the licensed eating establishment such as uh, bar, lounge or even nightclub. Some of them actually their name call themselves a nightclub. And, and then we found there are 15 of them. Uh, they are licensed eating establishment, but they, based on their website advertising information, they appear to be operating as an unlicensed light cup. And um, 
the reason we, we say that is when we look at their website and we see that they have DJ night, special music night, uh, there will be expensive alcoholic drinks menu, their operating hours is very uh, from late evening to early morning, their pictures and images of people standing around drinking. Um, so we look into those 15 places and want to find out what happened. And we found actually MLS had uh, laid charges to 10 of them in 2016. Um, there are quite a few, there are nine tickets and two summons, but four tickets and two summons are specifically for operating illegally as nightclub. So all 10 of these, uh, we understand that they continue to operate under the uh, licensed eating establishment uh, uh, license. So again, towards the end of our audit, we uh, obtained from MLS provided us a list of 43 eating establishments in the central district that they are potentially operating as nightclub. This list is from MLS uh, staff. So 43 in the central district. When you compare, right now the overall license for nightclub is 39 for the entire city. 43 just in the central districts, that's like double the entire population of our licensed nightclub. And these um, clubs, we brought pictures, we don't have them incorporated into our slides, but if, if the committee wanted to see a, a couple of pictures, we have them, but they're not on the line. It's not like you're looking to see whether it is one or the other as far as a restaurant. I mean, you have, I guess, you know, many, many people dancing, more of a, like, like a mosh pit kind of thing with DJ. You know, everybody knows what a nightclub is, and when you look at the pictures, it does reflect that. Um, so we're not looking for the ones that are just on the line. It's really, you know, how do you regulate those that are true nightclubs? So as good auditors, we always try to look into and find out so what's wrong, right? So what we found was actually, uh, again, is the bylaw. The definition of a nightclub in the bylaw uh, is, is quite long. But when we talked to MLS staff, the frontline staff and the people who enforce law, they told us that really the key words in the bylaw is these three, is sitting, is not provided for the majority of the patrons. And that's the key words in enforcing this, this, uh, this, this bylaw provisions. So for example, if there are 100 patrons 49 seats, that's minority, so they, are, they can be a nightclub, they, you know, they meet the night. But if they have 51 seats, then it's not a nightclub, right? And the definition really involves two factors, number of seats and patrons. Patrons is a dynamic factor. You have to wait until it operates and you go in. The officer literally has to go in while they're operating at night and count the number of heads, how many people, customer are there. Uh, some restaurants uh, have multiple floor. It's difficult for an uh, officer to count the head. And some of them, the patrons come and go. So there are uh, uh, lots of uh, enforcement challenges there. Uh, counting the number of seats is not that easy either. Uh, we were told that there are some places now they use benches, and it's very arguable like, how many seats are there. So I just. Uh, yeah. You would have like a bench along the wall and the whole center would be open. Uh, so you don't, uh, it's actually not, um, I guess you would just find as an eating establishment. It's, uh, so we, we just want to um, show you one of them, like this one has a, a circular bench and then, oops. The, um, the, really, the overall issue here, um, as, as we pull up, the overall issue is the definition. So when you look at it, if it's defined clearly what a nightclub is, and the test to be met is one that the officers can easily enforce and that the prosecution can easily prosecute, it'll, it allows the city to better enforce these areas. So we just, uh, so we this just is, show you. This is defined as a restaurant. Uh, there are other areas that have eating tables, but if you look at this, it's, it gives you, you know, it, you raise some question and then you have a number of people dancing. So, okay. go ahead. Yeah. Keep going. Just go back to the, so we're just going to go back to the presentations. Um, so just give us a minute to, thank you. 
So we have the form that's used to just give you an example. And it's not that this is the only area, it's just the way that the bylaws and the test should be looked at. So when we look at the um, um, license application form, the eating establishment and the, um, the process, so this is one of the form the applicants has to fill out, whether they apply for an eating establishment or a nightclub license. So when we look at a sample of these forms, even on the form itself, when the applicants provided the information, there's some hints that they're gonna be operating. It's not just as an eating establishment. So this one, we gave you an example. Uh, it's so that they're gonna have 270 uh, maximum uh, capacity, and they're gonna open from 4 p.m. till 3 a.m. They have DJ. And, and this one is, and many others are still uh, uh, approved as an eating establishment because of the definition that uh, MLS is not able to uh, decisively prove that they are a nightclub during the application process until they are operating. Mm -hmm. So at that, when the application is made, uh, uh, business establishments can apply to be a, an eating establishment. What we're looking for is that clear law and the follow-up mechanism to verify whether they're operating as an eating establishment or as a nightclub. So I've, it's equally important to point out that um, the existing bylaw classifications of uh, nightclubs and eating establishment were established long time ago. As far as I, we can tell, it's almost like since 2005. And there's really nothing in between an eating establishment and a nightclub license. And uh, we, we do recognize the restaurant industry changes in many places. They want to be eating establishments during the day and at night they want to like turn into a different venue. And also the city demographic has changed and uh, we, we really recommend it. That's, that's why we recommend a border review of the bylaw provisions and the classification of uh, eating establishments and nightclub. Mm -hmm. So overall, I'll begin where I started. Uh, MLS has a complex job. It's an array of uh, emergent issues. Uh, they are, have a lot of directives from various areas, and also um, the, some of the laws are not clear. So starting from the beginning, uh, making sure that the bylaws are clear, uh, making sure they're prioritized, uh, making sure the tests are there, and then the investigation is um, training and, and things happen to make sure that the uh, officers know how to meet those tests will really help to make sure that the city's direction and enforcement happens in a cost-effective manner. And I recognize that MLS has moved along on some different fronts, but overall we've um, recommended and uh, MLS has accepted um, that um, we leverage the Chief Transformation Officer. Uh, this is an area that I think would really benefit um, and to take a risk-based approach um, to make sure that services are delivered in a, a cost-effective manner and where possible leverage technology. Thank you. Thank you, Auditor. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Rashir. Um, with that, uh, may I turn this over for questions by visiting councillors? Councillor Carrier Janice, I have you first on the list. Thank you, Chair. Really appreciate the Auditor General um, getting in front of this report. Uh, this was something that I personally raised, especially with the, um, uh, the uh, restaurants uh, about a year ago. And when I sort of looked a little bit on the research, I was astounded to see that a uh, 3,000 square foot place, which is probably 40% of this room, people were advertising at 600 people to go in. It was also surprising that other ones that we're inviting people after hours and the tables were moved apart. And as you're saying, that there's no metal detectors, no um, um, bouncers, we can call that for another. And yet, we kept on allowing them to still continue working. And the safety of the, of the party guards, if I may say in that word, were put at risk. It's surprising that we haven't had any um, um, any difficulties as in other places and any uh, accidents, and thank God that we haven't. Um, is, I'm not gonna say this was a failure on our part as a city to, to look at that, but did we have to sort of wait for you to engage us, or should we have, I mean, as a city, as, as a, the MLS, we should have done this a little bit uh, sooner? I'll turn that to management. 
Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we uh, are aware that restaurants or eating establishments have been morphing into what some people may consider nightclubs. That's a, an issue that we've identified quite some time ago. Uh, did have some conversations in that regard through our liquor licensing task force, and it has formed part of the work plan for the review of 545 to look at how we are licensing eat esta eating establishments, including nightclubs, uh, writ large. So that it has been on our work plan. Yes. Moving forward. Um to the other general or, or the staff, uh, I mean, we've charged 10 people, 11 people, whatever the, na the number was. Are these people still continuing to operate and are we still vulnerable that an accident might happen tomorrow, the next day or the day after that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'm not clear in respect to the question about vulnerability or the assertion that the city is responsible for all activities that occur within a licensed premise. Uh, we license businesses, we license a myriad of different types of businesses. They are permitted to operate pursuant to the, the regulation that we lay out. Uh, and where there are, where there are cases of non-compliance, we have a suite of enforcement actions that we can take. Uh, let me be a little bit more specific, if I can, and maybe that you'll understand where my question comes from. An establishment that's 3,000 square feet packs in five, 400 people. It's not enough. We as a city have said to that establishment and you've laid charges on and say, look, you can't operate this. They're still probably continuing to operate that could be stand to be corrected here. Should an accident happen in that establishment because of overcrowding, would we not be also responsible? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, no, sir. I do not believe we would and I'll defer to my legal uh, colleagues to share. We license a business to operate in a certain way. Certainly issues in respect to overcrowding are also matters that are addressed, addressed through the FPPA or the Ontario Fire Code. So there's a variety of regulations that oversee uh, how a premise any business is, ought to, is responsible to operate under. Uh, we have a number of tools and access to the Toronto Licensing Tribunal if we have a, a convictions to bring towards the person's business license and other mechan mechanisms. Uh, but we certainly do not regulate based on a number of occupants that is governed under Ontario Building Code, Fire Code, and as well as the AGCO deals with occupancy in respect to the liquor licensing. I think I've made my point. Uh, the next question that I'm going to ask you is, how do we um, separate holistic um, body rub parlors to, if I can say, um, another term that's been used as a rub and tug? In a certain stretch in my ward, I've been told by the um, officers that I might have 39 uh, rub and tugs and also houses. How do you suggest that we go about shutting them down or even addressing the issue? Um, I'll turn that question to management and, and just say it is a complex matter, but I'll turn that to um, management for comment. Absolutely. Through you, Mr. Chair, just to be clear, the city does not license sexual services. We have a, a, a business license bylaw that governs body rub parlors. There is capped at 25. We have a business license category dealing with holistic practitioners. That includes holistic services such as Reiki, iridology, and a variety of different, uh, less traditional medicines or, or um, so methods. Are those, all, Thank you. Is, are those 25 all in my ward? Uh, no, sir. The 25 licensed body rub parlors, I do not believe there are any. No, there are none in uh, Ward 39. And those, those establishments have been in existence pretty, mel pretty well since the late 70s, which is the last time that the body rub parlor bylaw was updated. So I just I want to be very clear that I the holistic sign, license category is not a body rub parlor license category. That was the last question, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Palacio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First and foremost, thank you to the Auditor General for your presentation, an excellent presentation, and also a huge thank you to, to MLS staff for the amazing work that they've been doing. Now, with regards to the first question, uh, and um, during your presentation, you indicated that there is a need to step back and ponder in terms of how we are going to proceed and move forward. And at the same time, within your reports, you are stating that the purpose and the objective is to have clear, specific, and enforceable by laws for the city to be effective. If our city staff had the tools, and then we can do the work. 
you also mentioned about technologies and the possible solutions. Now, on that specific point, is I do have a question in terms of one of the directives that came to through council and the committee mainly uh, to a staff, and that goes back to January 21st, 2015. And, uh, and that's, um, there were two recommendations. The main one had to do with the comprehensive framework review of Chapter 545. And there were some requests at that point that if uh, that could be done in the second quarter of 2015, and hopefully to have a final report at the end of 2015. I believe it was a little bit too ambitious from our part to ask for that. But specifically, the report asked for, to streamline the processes to encourage the use of technology to make it easier for business to operate in Toronto. So I think that's one of the key pieces in terms of moving forward, making sure that our bylaws are in place. Why is taking a little bit too long? It's almost, it's going to be three years that we've been waiting for. And, uh, and the target date, according to the report, is 2019. Is there any way to move forward with that implementation? Uh, so through you, Mr. Chair, I think I'm hearing a question in respect to two pieces. One being the comprehensive review of our business licensing regime captured in Toronto Municipal Code Chapter 545. The other piece being what are we doing as far as implementing technology to address efficiencies. So on the review of 545, yes, we had an ambitious timeline, absolutely. Uh, a number of emerging issues developed uh, since the time we drafted that plan for 545. I don't think I need to go through the various uh, industries that have been disrupted and are continuing to be disrupted in that regard. So certainly the review of 545, I don't want to say the U word, uh, <laughs> The review of 545 uh, is a little bit later than what we would like, but I will say in the, this context, the review of any establishments and nightclubs, is, there has been bodies of work done through our liquor licensing task force and other meetings we've been having with the industry because we do believe there's a better way writ large to deal with the way we license uh, eating establishments of all kinds from Subway to some that are uh, more... Uh, uh, adventurous with music or what have you, as well as the work we're trying to do as a city to advance live music venues. So there's a lot of work to go around that piece. In respect to the technology, I can say that we do have a number of projects that are actually in flight right now. Our Data Mart Business Intelligence, we're through phase one into phase two. We're one of six divisions that have automated FPARS measures in that regard. We also have an RFP that should be hitting the street uh, next month, I hope, to procure, to look at our current systems, we have three systems, and through licensing, property standards, IBMS, and Chameleon with Animal Services, and that RFP, in partnership with Toronto Fire Services, with input from the Chief Transformation Officer, we are hoping to get out on the street uh, next month. Thank you. I have a few other questions, and uh, I'm not sure, Mr. Chairman, if you'd be kind enough maybe to, to allow us. I have a few questions with regards to the other two reports. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll put it, the question to the committee. If the committee pleases them, we can, we can do a second round. Thank you, Mr. Uh, in recognition, we are considering three reports here, but you still got a minute, so I'd, I'd see Thank if we can get Chairman. it in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you is um, to the Auditor General. In terms of the um, recommendation, that would be part two, the holistics. So is, um, we went through the review, and uh, I believe that it was in 2011, and by then we were told that, uh, and I was part of, uh, I was the chair of the licensing standards. So the, we have the holistic centers and practi practi practitioner business, those that um, deal with the traditional medi uh, medication and so on. Now, the legitimate ones that they operate between nine and five. Now, in your report, you are okay with them, right? with the holistic centers and practitioner businesses overall, the ones that... The therapeutic ones. Yes, yes, the therapeutic ones. It's, it's more related to what I call, instead of um, sexual services, the unauthorized services. If you have a dentist and they're offering, you know, unauthorized services, same kind of thing. So if it's therapeutic, if it reflects the bylaw, that's, that's fine. It's the services beyond that, that we think that council needs to get to ground. So there are okay, a we'll, we'll, just, we'll, we'll leave that Thank the you. last question. Um, once we get to the members, uh, if somebody wants to uh, place a motion, I'll place it to go to a second round. Um, Councillor Matlow. I'd be happy to, uh, to, to make a second. 
So we, we can do that right now. All the members of the committee in favor of uh, supporting a second round of questions? Thank you very much, that's carried. Um, we will come back to you, we'll let everyone get a turn here. Thank uh, you, Chairman. Councillor DeBearmaker, I think you're next on uh, the list. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for this report. I, I think maybe my first question would be to our MLS staff. Um, stepping back from some of the specifics, uh, and I've been on the licensing committee now for, for seven years, um, was, uh, was there anything that surprised you in this report? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, no. So some of the issues that our Auditor General has identified are not new to you. Uh, They're ongoing, I don't want to call them gray areas, but the ongoing challenges that you face in enforcing bylaws. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, that is correct. And perhaps the example of whether a, an establishment has 49 seats or 51 seats and that sort of flips over designation, that dance we've been doing for a very long time, I think. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes. And uh, to focus maybe on that, that example, to go from an eating establishment to a nightclub, I, I would think perhaps maybe in the suburbs it's not really such a big issue because the, the bar or the barrier to entry for uh, an entrepreneur to become a, a nightclub actually isn't that much more than being an eating establishment, correct? They have to have a metal detector, they have to have a bit more security, but if I want to open a nightclub, it's not that hard to open up a nightclub. Uh, yes, so through you, Madam Chair, the, the issue is the matter of zoning and the permissions. When the nightclub category was created in 2005, it was created around dealing with specific public safety issues that had arisen in the entertainment district. Uh, the, it was set out, I believe, as an interim measure to address ensuring there were public safety in these large venue spaces. Uh, so there is, as I mentioned earlier, a need, and we are discussing with City Planning, Toronto Building, ECDEV, uh, how do we address the interest of the people in the city in various pockets to go to places to enjoy live music, and then what do those venues look like, what is the underlying zoning permissions that are required to be in place, and then what are the appropriate licensing regulations that need to be enacted. So it's a, it's a large body of work, and to the Auditor General's comments, I wholly agree, it is complex and it requires uh, a great deal of work from a number, a number of uh, divisions. So it's uh, not that easy an answer. It's a bit oversimplified. <laughs> and, and when, and I saw the example given on the, uh, on the PowerPoint presentation, when somebody comes in, say in my ward out in the suburbs, and says, I want to open a nightclub, they're allowed to open a nightclub. You really can't say no to them. No, through you, uh, Madam Chair, any, uh, any applicant for an eating establishment or nightclub requires a zoning clearance that's done through Toronto Building. Uh, they enter Toronto Building, make that application for zoning clearance, and then that's shared with us. So the zoning needs to permit that type of a use. What we're getting into are the complexities in the manner in which uses are defined, what is or is not enshrined in each or other respective uh, regulation, be it zoning or licensing. So it's, it's not quite that simple, unfortunately. Right, and through you, Madam Chair, I'd imagine the, the difficulty with our bylaw as well in terms of these categories is that when we as councillors or members of the public call you up, your department up and say, there's noise at three o'clock in the morning, there's speeding, there's fist fights, there's people vomiting, some man peed in my bushes right in front of my, my veranda. Um, you can't really take that back to the club and say you're shut down. Uh, so if the club owner says to you, well, if somebody peed in somebody's bushes, ain't my fault. If somebody was vomiting outside of my establishment, ain't my fault. So again, isn't it the, the nature of this beast that we continue to struggle? So through you, Madam Chair, what I think you've well articulated, uh, Deputy Mayor DeBear Maker, is law enforcement is challenging. Uh, there are a variety of tools that we can use that are applicable to the various parties to whom we can hold to account. So for conduct such as noise in the premises, we have the noise bylaw. We have mechanisms for that. Uh, people walking down the street and urinating in public may be an, an issue with the police. And we do work with the police and the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario frequently on establishments that may be problematic. And we have discussed this at previous meetings where we bring to bear the variety of regulatory or other enforcement tools that are available to address the various issues but I think you've characterized it well. Uh, these, these matters can be complex. 
We encourage compliance. The bylaws are drafted such that it, it uh, allows for compliance. And then we have the tools of enforcement to deal for, with those instances where they are not. And, and thank you. And through Madam Chair, with my limited time, I'm going to ask maybe about the 168 directives that remain outstanding. Mm. I'm glad the Auditor General um, highlighted that as part of her presentation. Uh, for example, we're waiting on a report on, on whether we should m uh, microchip cats. <laughs> and yet that report is two years old two years waiting, um, do, uh, and I know you're staffed up more than you used to be, but wouldn't, shouldn't we conclude by this Auditor General's report that you do need, I'll call it an additional X number of staff or a staff member to help you catch up on those 168 directives? Uh, so through you, Madam Chair, I, I wish it was as simple as simply saying add one to 20 more policy staff. Uh, all of these bodies of work require significant public engagement, stakeholder engagement, and it requires the attention of management. So quite frankly, uh, to make sure that we are all doing this in, in fulsome consideration of the suite of issues we have for the city. Uh, so it's not necessarily a matter of bodies. I will share that we have, um, we have been working to prioritize the work that we've had, and we've had instances arise that we had not planned for, and I think my deputy city manager. And if I could just add through you, Madam Chair, the um, staff have pre prepared, and for the committee, a list of those items. We've grouped them in uh, subject matters. We've said these ones are gonna be taken care of in this way with this report at that expected time, and there's been a thorough discussion about workload and resources at committee and we'll continue to have to confront the uh, overwhelming demand for additional work from our staff. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. We will bring it into committee now, Councillor Ford. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as said by my colleagues, uh, another great report done by the Auditor General. Um, to start off, I'm gonna go through my questions uh, kind of numerically through the items here. So starting off on page seven, um, so 18 businesses were operating without valid or up-to-date licenses, uh, which uh, through the audit you have found. To, to, to understand the scope uh, of the issue here at hand, how many businesses do we have in the city of Toronto, licensed businesses? Uh, licensed. Um, there are 87,000, I guess, licensed businesses. I think we have, uh, up the very first slide, we have 87,000. Um, there is, uh, we ha also have identified about, I think it's 900 that were unlicensed, but they've identified, they've found, they've, many of these have become licensed, so there's probably about 50% that are still um, unlicensed of, uh, of the 900, so. Right, so I guess the, the magnitude of, of the problem here is, is pretty minimal when it comes to like percentage-wise. So you, 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 we are well below 1%. Percentage-wise, yes. Right, okay. Um, so moving through on to page eight. Um, so just understand, so, t so some business, businesses have had 10 inspections here. Some have not even been inspected. Um, to understand, I guess, the, I guess through uh, MLS staff here, um, is this because they have concerns with businesses, uh, the MLS officers, so they are um, attending the sites more often? Uh, so through you, Madam Chair, yes. We, we direct our officers to go where we believe there may be issues arise or where we've received complaints or we have evidence thereof. So there will be a cadre of, of businesses that are operating compliantly, of which we have no complaints for, and based on the demands on our time and the resources we have, we focus them where we know we need to, we try to focus them where we know they need to be. So I know after council passing the landlord licensing, I know MLS has been undertaking the approach of kind of ranking the issues. Uh, I know that's currently underway. Are we gonna be looking at kind of the same methodology for businesses? Uh, so, sorry, through you, Madam Chair. So the Apartment Building Standards Program was a proactive uh, program to start, and, and thanks for calling that out because we've done a ton of great work to implement that. Uh, the reviews we're doing right now are to get a sense of the state of affairs in the, uh, the building maintenance. 
Uh, so as far as take, using data to support where we're focusing our enforcement efforts, you're bang on. We have uh, created positions or data, data and scheduling analysts to help us do that, utilizing the data that we can with the existing system, but also that's why we invested a great deal of, the city has invested a great deal of time and money into moving forward with phase two of our Data Mart BI tool, which will also help drill that out, as well as the new systems we're seeking to procure, which were, will also help target uh, you know, recidivism and, and repeat offenders. So it's absolutely the same approach. Great. And now on page nine of uh, the presentation, um, average 53 days to close an investigation. Uh, personally speaking, I, you know, I've worked with many, with MLS uh, on a regular basis. Um, now, uh, but so through the understanding, or through my understanding, some investigations are very complex. And I guess we are bound by provincial law on what we can and can't do and, and municipal policy. Um, does that contribute to these to the length of these investigations and I guess the size of them as well? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, absolutely, Councillor Ford. Uh, every investigation, every inspection can lead you down a very various different paths or lead you down no path at all. So it certainly depends on the nature of the complaint, the manner in which we need to undertake the reviews, how often we may need to return, how quickly we can uh, connect with complainants, how quickly we can connect with uh, the licensee. So there's a variety of factors that can, you know, uh, my uh, colleague Rod Jones has said you could solve a homicide in 15 minutes or 15 years. So, you know, some of these, these instances, every case is a case-by-case -case basis based on the merits of the evidence we have, the evidence we need, the contacts we can make, and how long that takes. So I guess this would be my last question. So in order to, I guess, cut this down and be more efficient, um, I guess, would you recommend policy changes or does it really, where, where, where does the challenges lie? Does it rely on resources you have in MLS? Is it policy? Is it, if we can make a change, where would that change be to pick this up? Uh, so through you, Madam Chair, it, it would be challenging to say that there's one thing that could be changed to impact the number of days it takes to undertake an investigation. Uh, those are simply the, the cases, that's, the, that's our business. Law enforcement's difficult, sometimes it's lengthy, and sometimes it doesn't always turn out the way we want it to, right, depending on which side of the, the uh, matter you're on. Uh, I, do, I do reiterate, and the, the key point I think that comes out of the Auditor General's work is the importance of doing very thoughtful, very deliberate, very well-researched uh, decisions when we are crafting regulation. I think that is something that we have endeavored to do through the time that, that I know my predecessors have and I have done and, and all my colleagues do, is to bring clarity around what the rules are so people can willfully comply, make it clear, clearly understood for those who, the majority of people who comply with the law, and then we've got the tools to deal with those, those outliers that don't. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just have a couple questions and then Councillor Holliday can ask questions after. Um, in recommendation number seven to have the Chief Transformation Officer um, look at, at enforcement activities, are there other areas in the city that also do enforcement that maybe we can look at? Uh, I know you haven't done, done a report on them or investigated them, but. Um, best practices or, or possible overlap where um, uh, we can learn things and add those into to how MLS does investigations and how other areas do their investigations? Uh, thank you. I'll turn that to the city manager. He's probably best appropriate to answer that. Um, so recommendation number seven to have the chief transformation officer look at, at, uh, at this. Are there other areas in the city that do their own investigations that we can either look at best practices or, or look at other areas where we can learn from those divisions, um, possible overlap of, of what they're doing? Absolutely. A very, uh, very important question, and I appreciate it. Um, I want us to step back and actually uh, pay attention to the answer that the uh, uh, head of MLS gave to an earlier question, which was, was this audit a surprise? 
and in many respects this audit is not a surprise and in many respects we do need to understand as a city that we have a wide variety of inspection functions in public health, in fire, in building and a variety of other areas. These have something profoundly in common which is that they are structured inspection services, they involve um, uh, entry, enforcement, Provincial Offenses Act, prosecution, a variety of other things. Many of the issues are specific to MLS in terms of the bylaws but many of the issues are more broadly in terms of process. As we begin the journey of a transformational uh, uh, investment in changing the way we interface with technology and changing the way we manage and track uh, human resources, it will make sense to do that on a broader basis. So we will in fact reach out and make sure that we deal with many of the other uh, inspection functions, fire, uh, building, uh, public health and a variety of others. Thank you. That, that was all I had. Thanks. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions. Um, get my timer going there. Is it fair to say that with respect to governing over and regulating places of business, the, the places of business that are in place that was described in this, I'm talking really about all three reports, that uh, MLS is uh, maybe one petal on the flower or maybe better, one leg of the black widow spider. I mean, there's a lot of other things that are involved in this. And I think about Councillor Kerry Janice's question about safety in a room filled with people. Is it fair to say that there are other people like fire services that are involved in this? And could you describe some of the breadth of the other agencies and parts of the city that are involved that, uh, that are cooperatively looking after these places? Uh, so to you, Mr. Chair, as I've mentioned, the partnerships that we have with our other enforcement divisions are key. Um, so certainly we've partnerships with Toronto Building, Toronto Fire Services, Toronto Public Health. We uh, were just meeting with the Alcohol Gaming Commission of Ontario last week, and we were up again, uh, the Toronto Police Service. So all of these various bodies that all have a piece of the responsibility, uh, we, are, we are engaged with. And we do the best we can to integrate and share in each other's uh, enforcement efforts. So, you know, the old saying goes, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Um, Presumably when somebody has a great idea to build a restaurant and whatever vision they have, they've got to go into the building department to submit plans for renovations. Um, do the plans examiners look at things that appear to be configured like a nightclub? You know, something that doesn't have a kitchen, right? You know, what kind of restaurant is this if you've got a 10 square foot kitchen and a bunch of open space? So presumably there is some early uh, process here. To what degree is MLS integrated into that process? And maybe it's a broader question because buildings kind of manages that startup phase and planning manages that startup phase and then um, MLS needs to own and look after the asset through the life of the asset. Can you talk to me about that bridge and what vision there might be in some transformation on that? Uh, so to, to you, Mr. Chair, absolutely we rely heavily on our partners in Toronto Building. They're the ones that provide the zoning clearance for the various businesses we require, require a zoning clearance for. Uh, and certainly there is a significant level of due diligence that is done on, on their part. Uh, we take that, we take the information we're provided by the applicant and we make a determination based on that. Uh, you know, I, I love your analogy of walks like a duck, talks like a duck. We tried that through one of our court matters. It didn't quite fall, flow through that easily. Uh, it's, it's not always we know that the duck is going to be a goose. Got it. The duck may appear as a duck, and for the purposes of issuing a permit and a license, we have to gauge ourselves and govern ourselves, and they have a right to uh, business licenses, they have a right to building permits based on the information that we're provided. So there's a responsibility to act and treat the duck as a duck. If the duck turns out to be a goose later, that's where the enforcement comes in. Presumably, that's good. Uh, presumably. <laughs> I have animal services, so you know you're going to get animal it. references. <laughs> I got it. Um, Presumably professionals put their stamp of certification on things that they put into the building department for approval. Is there any uh, tentacle or vector to go along that avenue to say, um, you know, professional, you're designing a duck, it should be a duck at the end of the day, and we want to hold you accountable as a city to make sure that it's, it's going that way. Is there any future in that or hope in that? Because it, it seemed to me that, you know, part of the early warning on this is the gateway of, applications coming in for plans and 
somebody can look at a, at a floor plan and figure out pretty quick um, where it's going. Uh, so to you, Mr. Chair, certainly I think the opportunity and where this really starts is how we are going to regulate around this industry, whatever this industry be, eating establishment, nightclub, entertainment facilities. And it starts with how we define those uses from a land use perspective, then how we define them from a licensing perspective. Uh, those, having those well defined will help inform the processes later on. I can, I can look to my friends in Toronto Building to share the rigor that they put in the current process. Through, through the chair, a um, couple points I'd like to bring up is, one is when we are issuing the building permits, we do ask those questions and look at it to see, based on the information we have, how is the use, how does it, what does it look like it's going to be used for and assign the right category. The second part I want to address is your question with respect to professionals making statements and where those statements may turn out to be different after the fact. In Toronto Building, we do rely on registered professionals to provide us with information. There are circumstances where that information turns out to be different later on in the process. Um, the City of Toronto doesn't have the ability to regulate those professionals. There's acts um, that do that. But when those matters come to our attention, we do refer those cases back to the professional associations for their review and action. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any members of the committee that wish to pose a question? Otherwise, um, we have agreed to do a second round, and uh, I will invite uh, any visiting members then to ask those questions. Councillor Karajanis, you were first, and then Councillor Palacio, I've got you number two. Thank you, Chair, and I appreciate the uh, indulgence of allowing us a second round of questions. Um, my question to the Chair, to the staff, uh, and certainly to the Auditor General, what tools do you foresee us needing in order to meet the challenges ahead in the MLS? Is it people? Is it financing? Is it ch uh, change of method of operation? Is it better reporting? Um, I think uh, MLS and I are on the same page in relation to getting clarity in some of these areas to assist with their enforcement. Uh, and then looking at, the, you look into the transformation officer to assist MLS in making sure that they transform to make sure things are streamlined um, and the right resources go in the right area. Um, they're working on some uh, systems for better information. I think that's good but everything flows from the beginning and so making sure that's all connected is important. So I would start with making sure the laws are clear. That's a, a, a matter for council and for legal count, for city council and legal council. I would prioritize uh, to make sure that you are prioritizing perhaps one of these areas over the uh, microchip and CAS, although I think that's still an important matter. Um, so, you know, MLS cannot be all things to everybody, so prioritizing, being clear on the laws, that's a running start, and then the rest will flow in after that. Do we need changes, do we need to request changes to, um, on the Ontario legislation side that will give us access to um, uh, premises, give us access to the clubs? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll phase this, this uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, in fighting rooming houses up in my part of the world, the officer can knock once, can knock twice, can knock three times, issue a letter, uh, then we have to tell them why we're going in and write it in the letter. Of course, that signals, uh, uh, flags all go up, puts up the house and he moves out. And for them to get in, then we have to get a search warrant. Is there something that could be done to allow to streamline the process that we can go to the provincial government and say, listen, we need tool changing in order for us to, to go ahead. Because when you got a provincial, I mean, when you got a, 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 an MLS officer having to go back to the same resident four or five times, we're getting the heat, we're putting the heat on them, and they can't get in. Is there something that could be done in order to prioritize? Is there something that we as a council have to write to the Ontario legislature and say, we need these changes in order for us to have better, res I mean, manage our resources better that we don't have to go keep going back to the same location time after time. Uh, uh, thank you, and through you, um, Mr. Chair, one of our first recommendations was to look to legal to um, really take a good look at enforcement mechanisms, right from unlicensed businesses to unauthorized services. And they're going to need to, time to take that away and to come up with the best recommendations on what would work. Again, starting with a clear bylaw, then they can move to the uh, leveraging enforcement. 
Right through, Mr. Chair, I just feel it's important because the Auditor General may not have the context. Uh, Councillor Karajanis is referencing our right of entry to dwelling houses. There's authority in the City of Toronto Act and authority through the Planning Act when we're engaging in zoning uh, investigations that we are required to tell people that they have a, that we would like to enter, why we would like to enter, and they have a right to refuse. So it's provincial statute that governs uh, our authorities for right of entry. I will also add that from a criminal standpoint, the police require a Feeney warrant if they want to seek entry onto even lands. So while I appreciate the effort and the enthusiasm, the likelihood of the government giving us carte blanche uh, right to enter a dwelling home is uh, not going to happen. Um, that was not the intention that I put forward, yeah. but when you have what? MLS officers going back three or four times in order to go in, certainly that's a waste of, of time of the MLS officers. So my question, again, I'm going to go back and, and uh, try to rephrase this in a different text. I mean, I was just giving an example, and I thank you for bringing that out. I mean, if you're, if you're, I mean, as a former police officer were chasing somebody, you wouldn't tell them why you were chasing them. Uh, you will do your investigation and the charges, however. My question, going back to the Auditor General through the, uh, through the Chair, is the following. Should we be looking and working in conjunction with legal to ask the province of Ontario for better mechanism for us to do the enforcement piece and to have the right of entry or to have the right of examination so people, I mean, you know, like, should we give the officer more powers? If a policeman stops you, you can't say no. Uh, you know, should we give the officer the most more part? Last question. So through you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, my first statement is always be clear on the law. And then we said to prioritize. And then we said across the board in relation to certain areas of unlicensed businesses and of unauthorized services, we did refer to legal to make sure that they had enforcement mechanisms. I can't speak to uh, right of entry, but that, that's for the legal team to determine. I'm simply saying that we saw areas, not the area you're speaking about, but areas where we did have to increase our enforcement uh, tools, and, uh, and uh, that's so I answered at that general level. So you may want to refer your question to legal, who's here today. And legal says? On the issue of entry into any business or home, we have to deal with things through, with in, keeping in mind the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So if a business is licensed, and we do have provisions under the city bylaws to be able to enter licensed premises for specific purposes during working hours, that's one thing. If they're unlicensed businesses, then we don't have a right to enter without a warrant. And the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms under Section 8 uh, prohibits uh, anyone from going in without having a warrant in those circumstances. You signal them before you go in? Does a cop signal somebody that he's doing an investigation? And I, I, okay. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll you can go ahead and answer that, but... Okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Palacio, I have you next. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to the Auditor General. Is in uh, your report, it's quite clear that the rec I'm referring to the Professional Holistic Associations, the, PH, um, the PHAs. The requirements for the PHAs were added to the bylaw in 2005 following the MLS staff report, and the intent was for the city to rely on the accredited PHAs to govern the members to ensure integrity of the service. Now, within your report, you indicate that when you did your review, you found the top 10 PHAs, and, uh, and that was by membership. And you found that a number of them appeared to operate on paper only, that they were not even, they don't even have an address. And, uh, and there is something fundamentally wrong there. Is, can you just? Uh, I'm going to turn that to my team, uh, and they did the work in that area. Um, yes, um, we, we actually um, try to um, visit each one of them and, and, and try to verify their address. We also try to uh, look at their website, and some of them have no website, no telephone contact information. Uh, some of them, it's a, a PO box. 
uh, we did go into uh, some places. Uh, they're supposed to be a public um, PHA places, and they, some of them actually is a um, massage parlor itself. Mm -hmm. So we're requiring to be registered practitioners to go to these places to become registered. And so we were trying to follow that route of a normal practitioner to see if we could determine if it was legitimate or if, if they were there. And we, we have some concerns. Great. So the, does the city rely on the expertise of the PHS for the governing and for these accredited bodies to license the holistic industry and in spite of all these categories of the value for parlors and, and so on. Yeah. Is, yeah, through you, Chair, it is our understanding, but I will allow management to, ans to answer why they are in the bylaw. So through you, Mr. Chair, uh, in 1998, when the holistics category was created, it was actually a reliance upon a certifying body such as a college or what have you. In, in and around 2005, 2006, it was felt that that process wasn't working, that people were uh, abusing the system, so this idea of a professional, professional holistic association was created. The bylaw lays out what is required of a uh, professional holistic association to be added onto our list of approved PHAs. That requires a report and approval for, through committee and council. We do have legitimate professional holistic associations, the Ontario Herbalist Association, Canadian Reiki, iridologists, etc. Uh, we, are, we are aware that some people have chosen to exploit the manner in which the PHA uh, bylaw, part of the bylaw is, uh, is drafted, which relies on a paper review only with no revocation and uh, no further investigation. It, it also, as mentioned, we do not have regulatory authority over the PHAs. There was no articulable municipal purpose for doing so at the time, I presume. Uh, so we do know that these are problematic and we have undertaken a review in the past uh, and we, as part of a full-scale review of these articles of Chapter 545, this absolutely needs to be addressed. Thank you. Yes, um, wouldn't you agree that uh, the governing licensing aspect, mainly the oversight of the body wrap parlors and holistic centers, it's confusing, it lacks oversight, and is not enforceable? So, um, just looking at the whole thing, and when I speak, I'll speak to that, Mr. Chairman, and the reasons why, I believe that one of the main problems that we have throughout the city is the proliferation of these business all over that they're not accountable to anyone. So my question to you is, wouldn't it be wise, perhaps, maybe just to, to point the finger where the problem is, is non the DAX, but, and then to come up with solutions that are going to work and to make sure that's not only going to resolve the problems out there, but also bring this, the revenue that the city needs in terms of having something that's under a regulated framework. Our role is simply to highlight uh, if there are areas for improvement and make recommendations. And, and really it's for the city management team in consultation with city council to come up with the right approach. Uh, so we've laid out some of the areas we think need to be addressed and it's really for the city to take that and run with it and come up with the solution that works for the city. And through you, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, just to be very clear, the bylaw is not unenforceable. The bylaws are enforceable. But to, to your point, Councillor Palacio, I think there's a broader conversation that needs to be had for us as a city to understand why there has been a proliferation of other activities in businesses that are licensed differently. This could be happening in a licensed public garage. It's hap it could be happening in any type of license category. But I just want to make sure it's very clear. Our bylaws are enforceable. Can we do better at reflecting the current business environment through our regulation? There is opportunity to do that. But we have enforceable bylaws. Law enforcement is challenging, but we are continuing to enforce the rules that we have on the books. And we'll look forward to a, dis a broader discussion on this topic when we bring the reports forward. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Ford, I have you next on the list. Uh, pardon me, um, I should have checked. Um, Councillor Nunziata, you're visiting. Um, do you have a question? <clears throat> 
So you're correct, the, our bylaws are enforceable, uh, but the problem is, is because we have so many uh, problem establishments and, and, and complaints where we, uh, ongoing, like, um, <clears throat> Uh, could go on for years, same establishment, and uh, and uh, we have to send enforcement, bylaw enforcement out there constantly, and uh, uh, issuing a fine, and then they delay the process in the courts, and you're talking three or four years later, this problem established is still a problem. Um, so we have our bylaws, but maybe I, I think uh, what we need to do, and I've been I've been advocating for that for years, is maybe zero tolerance, increasing the fines on these establishments where you have to continue reinspection, because that's where we're spending all our energy and resources. And, and uh, being able to find these problem establishments, like a high fine, and not go through the court system. I, I think that's really where the problems are with, uh, with the inspections. Um, so increasing the fines, and as well, um, um, licensing. We have tons of reports that we've requested uh, that's been years, and we haven't had an opportunity. The reports haven't been... Uh, uh, Pardon? Question. Yeah, that was one question. So as far as uh, the staff bringing forward the reports is the lack of staffing. I, I, I don't know if, if you, when you did your investigation and, um, you know, uh, maybe asking the province for the tools where we can be a little more aggressive in addressing these uh, these problem establishments, and and the other question is liquor license establishments. Most of the complaints we get that are licensed, the businesses have liquor licenses, and uh, we need the province uh, to uh, work with the city on closing these establishments up and and revoking their license. So those are my questions. There's a lot in there, and I think there's a lot in there for staff. Uh, there's, we've. The things that you've raised, we have considered in the audit, but our role is not to come up with a solution. It's, it really is management, and I think that they do need that time to take away, but you've raised some things that we were, um, you know, thinking about as we were going through it, uh, but we, we don't recommend those kinds of solutions. We recommend that management take it away and determine what the right solution is. And I think it has to begin with the right bylaw and prioritizing and, and start really getting these areas addressed. Well, what do you mean by the right bylaw? I mean that um, there, in the holistic area, there's a number of unauthorized services. The question is, um, what is it that city council would like to have in that bylaw legal to define how to, to deal with those aspects? Uh, what is the enforcement mechanism? Is it a higher penalty um, or is it something else in enforcement? There's a whole range of things that have to be considered. So I, we found, um, we can understand why some of these areas are challenging to enforce uh, and why you need to keep going back. But I think there's an opportunity for clarity here and there's an opportunity to um, identify what's most important and get those areas done. So, um, which means that we need to, as a council, move a, a, a bylaw um, and work with the, the city legal. Is, is that what you're recommending? I recommend, uh, we've highlighted two areas where there are improvements. Are I'm sorry I wasn't here for your presentation, okay. so I we, apologize. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. We highlighted in the area of holistics, also in the area of restaurants. There are two examples. There's other examples, and I know that MLS will know there are examples where clarity needs to be brought. Uh, and it's really now for s management to bring recommendations to you on how to fix maybe those in other areas. And there's a lot of a body of work here. 545 is a very large bylaw, so prioritizing the areas to be addressed first are important. So that's so it's really for management to fix. Okay, uh, maybe I can ask Tracy to respond. Uh, sure. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the the reference Councilor Nunzi added to uh, fines, just for clarity. For part one offenses, the fines are set by the Senior Regional Justice of the Peace for the province of Ontario. Uh, the provincial statute gives us the, 
the maximum fines that may be levied subject to what is embedded in our bylaws as well. And as we draft 545, or actually as we draft any of our bylaws, we ensure that we embed in the bylaw all the provisions that will that we can have to allow a justice of the peace when they're adjudicating on a matter that's in the courts, the appropriate level of fine. So that's not necessarily, you know, we don't set the fines by bylaw. It's set in provincial statute or by the senior justice and adjudicated through the courts. Uh, but your, your reference, and we have discussed it, and it is a body of work for us to do when we undertake more broadly the business licensing regime in Chapter 545 in the, the general provisions uh, and opportunities that we may have as a city now that we've moved some of our work towards administrative penalties, uh, and whether that has an opportunity for us in business licensing, and that is discussions that we are having. I don't know if you want to add anything there. So certainly as we draft the bylaws, we ensure, as we did with 546 uh, and our, our apartment building bylaw, that we have the opportunity for the courts to attach the maximum allowable fines as per the provincial statute. But it is ultimately up to the courts, when it is a judi adjudicated matter, setting the fine that is payable. So the solution, Malasa, the solution is to eliminate the court system. So through, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we love our that. friends in legal and the judiciary. They play an extremely important role to make sure that people have their charter rights met and access to due process. Okay. But there are opportunities for us to, uh, to look at alternative uh, in compliance tools, and one of those alternative, alternative compliance tools may lie in administrative penalties, which the province has authorized us to do in certain circumstances. So. I'll, uh, my Thank you very much. Councillor Ford, you've been patient. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the speaker would be a wonderful judge, so maybe we can move that motion. Um, <laughs> so, so, so uh, for her to be appointed as a judge? Uh, well, let's not go down that path. Yeah. All right. Th th so, th thank you. Um, and actually, I, I, I am on kind of the same line, line of questioning as the speaker here. Um, uh, is so around fines. What what is the maximum fine for, uh, let's say, an illegal operating nightclub that we can? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I, the Provincial Offenses Act allows for the maximums. I think for a corporation is. 25,000 individuals, I think is 5,000. It depends on which statute's being applied. In this case, it would be the POA. Uh, there are also, I don't, have, I don't think I have it with me, uh, whether we have embedded uh, allowance for special fines or continuing fines. I, some of our bylaws have it. I just can't recall off the top of my head if they have it here. Uh, certainly, if, if you want to follow Councillor Nunziata's track and uh, request the province to increase the maximum fines in the provincial statutes uh, that the courts may then look to, that would be a thing to ask for. But as far as we're concerned, we operate within the confines of that, that allowable amount. Now, $25,000 isn't a light fine. Um, so we have the ability of doing that, and, and I, I think uh, very similar to my last uh, question, the first round, having experience working with MLS uh, and w when they issue fines, so you have the ability to do so, but if it is a first time, uh, not offense, but if it's first time it came to your attention, it tends to be lower and we work our way up. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, if I could just take a, a little bit of a moment to talk about fines in general. So under the POA, there's two processes that will uh, be affected by bylaw offenses. So number, the first part is under Part 1 of the Provincial Offenses Act, and that's what people refer to as those ticket offenses. So that's when you get a ticket, and it has a mount on it, and it says, you can pay this out of court, and it ends it. Okay, and those are set amounts, and those were what were referred to as set fines. Those are the ones that are approved by the regional senior judge for the City of Toronto. And those are approved uh, by him or her, whoever's sitting at the time. The other way we can proceed under a bylaw offense is under part three, where there is not a fine amount defined, and the Justice of the Peace has a range that they can determine what fine will be applied. When we go to court, we can ask from the prosecution's perspective for a particular fine, but ultimately it's up to the Justice of the Peace to determine the appropriate fine. And what they will do is consider the sentencing principles, including is this a first-time offense? Has the person brought the establishment into compliance? Um, what have they done having 
been notified of the offense. Is this a continuing offense? Is this someone who has been here 10 times and hasn't paid a dollar of their fines? Uh, is this someone who is trying to uh, deal with the law but can't pay the fine? So these so are all things factors. that they'll consider. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of mitigating factors. Right. Okay, and I guess my last question on that, um, you know, I, I sympathize with my downtown colleagues having to put up with, you know, some of the noise complaints that surround them, and I'm sure many, many more. Um, have we seen it uh, currently um, affect when we do charge or when we do lay, you know, charges? Th does that affect, uh, is it a positive effect? Do we see uh, others kind of bringing themselves back to what they are licensed for. Is it effective? When we do it, are, are they effective? Uh, so through you, Mr. Chair, that's it's a great question, Councillor Forks. It really speaks to the, the effectiveness enforcement in respect to compliance or, or the level of willful compliance. Uh, you know, I would say, you know, as I mentioned earlier, generally, most people operate in compliance with the law and providing them clear direction on what compliance looks like is very helpful and that's what we endeavor to do through a range of enforcement efforts. We have many people who will comply after we've attended their property, explained to them the rules just orally and they understood I didn't know I was supposed to do that or I didn't know I was supposed to do this and they'll fix the issue. We wouldn't necessarily track that. The, the indicator of that would be that we didn't have to go back. Right, so that would be an indication of willful compliance from our first enforcement effort of just attendance and speaking and educating, which is a first key step in enforcement. Uh, so, you know, I think if we, we would need to look back, and, and that's where the data analytics will be very helpful, uh, and, and be able to articulate the level of recidivism of, of premises based on our enforcement efforts. Uh, a little bit complicated to do that at this point with our data, uh, but I think, you know, we, those that are problems are going to continue to be problems and we have a suite of tools to address them. Uh, we just used our authority under the City of Toronto Act, Section 380, to obtain an interim injunction against illegally operating marijuana storefronts. Uh, and those two have closed and we're carrying on in that regard. Uh, that had nothing to do with bylaws, that had everything to do with the City of Toronto Act. So, uh, you know, we've got a variety of tools and as indicated, law enforcement's messy. Uh, but, you know, mostly we have people who are good business operators in the city, people who want to comply, and for those who don't, then that's where we come in and, and escalate the enforcement as appropriate. It's a great question and a measure that I'm going to hope to be able to answer as we advance with our data warehouse project and case management and business systems. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there any other questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, um, I will invite um, visiting members of council to speak. Councillor Palacio, I have you first. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First and foremost, and um, I want to thank the Auditor General and her team for bringing all these comprehensive reports with excellent recommendations. Thank you. It's um, and one of the great things is that uh, our MLA staff, they have embraced those recommendations as well in terms of implementation. So that's a great way to start. Also, I would like to compliment uh, my members of council from the Licensing Standards Committee. We have, uh, I believe, four. We're, we don't constitute, Mr. Chairman, a quorum at this point from the MLS, but I'm glad that uh, well, my One, my two, colleagues four. are here as well to voice concerns that are important to them. But as chair of the, of the Zero Toronto License Standards Committee, is I want to thank city staff from MLS for their hard work, for their level of commitment, and, um, and for making difficult decisions that overall is uh, this committee, the municipal licensing, deals with everything under the sun, as you can imagine. We have gone through the taxi industry review, the Uber debate, the holistic industry that we're talking about now, the cannabis file, and uh, the food truck industry, 235 directives, either that came through city council or through the committee or members of council. And on that, Mr. Chairman, and members of uh, council, it's extremely important to understand this part that uh, every time that additional reports like for chickens, for pilot projects and whatever else that keeps on adding more pressure to them so we cannot ask them the impossible. 
So we have to be mindful of that. And what they are doing and what they have done is to create the work plan that was adopted by the committee from those 235 directives to bring 21 projects and uh, to, to cancel. And I'm very confident that's going to take place. I know that there has been some pushbacks, but eventually we are getting there. So it's a very exciting community, community to deal with. Uh, it's not boring, that's for sure. Now, the problem with regards to what we are dealing here with is that um, the bylaws, and, and I'm not saying that bylaws are not enforceable, but the nature of, um, of some of the bylaws that they are not clear, they are not specific, and, uh, and for that reason, somehow, they are not enforceable to many people out there, especially those who are breaking the law. So, and I believe that, especially when it comes to the, to the holistic industry, and I'm referring more to the illegal, uh, the, there are so many names within those categories, but the illegal rabbit, rabbit uh, tags. Rabbit tags and whatever you call them, that we have, we have them all over the city. And that's creating a tremendous problem to our local neighborhoods. I get, hundreds of phone calls as it relates to that. To noise, the illegal activities that comes along with it in terms of drug dealing, whatever else, because that's the real truth. And some of them are not, the ones who are licensed under the existing zoning, they are operating from wherever they are allowed. But the illegal ones, they're opening up within commercial strips and small malls where they are going undetectable and they are working at night. These are not legal business. When you have some, when you have a business out there that they are working until three, four, five o'clock in the morning, that speaks volumes. When you see people coming in and out and um, at, during all hours of the night, disturbing the local community, residential communities, that leaves a lot to be desired. So the problem is, from that perspective, in terms of bringing some clarity to the bylaws, bylaws that have the real teeth in terms of enforcing them. It has many talks from that perspective. Is um, one of the things that I wanted to, 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 to bring forward is that um, bars, and that's one of the points that Councilor Nunciera was talking about within our neighborhoods. And that has been something huge within the MLS, within the alcohol and gaming, and the Toronto Police Services. Now, that's where one of the problems remains in terms of noise, in terms of problematic, these are very problematic locations that these small bars are becoming nightclubs very often at night. And they are going undetected as well without any enforceability because of the so-called hours of operation. I've been told that under the existing legislation, the, the city doesn't have the ability to control the hours of operation. I was corrected, I believe it was yesterday, by the Auditor General who mentioned that is, the city does have the ability of controlling those, that aspect in terms of the hours of operation. So that's something that I will bring forward either in terms of a motion to City Council to deal with that. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. And thanks so much for this great report. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kerry Janis. <laughs> However, that's not right. the issue. It's uh, a great subject to us, and this is why we're all here, and I want to thank the Ottawa General and um, MLS staff for working through the difficulties. However, still um, work has to be done. I've seen we highlighted some issues, such as the, uh, the issues with uh, holistic rub and tugs, as you want to say them. Uh, you outlined the problem of um, restaurants been turning into nightclubs at night. You also outlined the, the problem that a lot of these restaurants have, uh, have a lot of people in it after hours and certainly uh, something that an accident or we um, might happen and thank God that it hasn't happened to now. 
Um, I've heard from legal staff um, and appreciate where they're coming from as far as the quote unquote Charter of Rights is concerned and the way that you want to interpret it. There's a lot of interpretations of that. Um, I think we need to have tools that uh, allow our um, staff, uh, our uh, MLS staff to enter uh, businesses or premises um, a little bit more readily and I think we need to go back to uh, the province and ask for those uh, uh, rights that we can enter. Uh, I don't think we need to signal somebody that why the, the investigation is ongoing. Certainly the police did not come in and, and, and signal you that uh, well, they want to talk to you if there's a murder and say we want to talk to you about the murder and you're a suspect about being a murder. Certainly they don't do that. Um, and overall, I want to thank, thank the staff for, for bringing here. However, there's challenges and uh, things that we need to, to move ahead. We need to make sure that uh, MLS has the right tools, um, be it computer-wise, be it reporting-wise, be it um, uh, reporting with other um, uh, departments. Uh, I mean, we do have a lot of areas where the, the, the Department of um, Buildings and, uh, goes in. They, and they, they see something not being done right or they see something being done that it would lead to difficulties, be it a bar, be it a, um, a home that somebody wants to uh, re, um, reinvent and uh, so it will be a room and house. Uh, those are the things that we need to make sure that the departments talk among themselves and, and we break down those silos. Although that we do have the 311 process and uh, people can report to that, I think the need to be able to interactively look uh, for the staff of MLS or the buildings department to interactively look at a site and signal it should be something that it, it has to be done. Um, the process of merging those two, I mean, emerging the reporting system has to be engaged. Uh, reporting at 311 has to certainly, um, uh, the, the, the website of 311 needs to be uh, reinvigorated and brought up to date. There's certainly the problems there. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing uh, how uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms will allow people to respond and make our places safe. Because when you have uh, somebody that says, you cannot come to my premise once, twice, and then we signal them why they were coming in, and this person is still keeping operating. Just this morning, I got a, an email from somebody that lives in a condo up in the penthouse, and he says, on the 23rd floor below me, there's a rooming house and they're using the master bedroom in order to cook. That puts my constituents at, um, at risk. Something should, ha should something happen there. We need to make sure that people's lives, we're not dealing here with somebody that's breaking the law because they're selling a hot dog, a hot dog stand outside. We're dealing with people's life and that's immense. And, and I have to tell you, the staff of MLS has done a wonderful work. Um, looking forward for them to, to be able to do more. And uh, uh, I guess as the Vice Chair of Licensing and Standards, uh, with my uh, chair here, we thank them for all the work that they're doing, and especially from legal with the Charter of Rights Compliance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor DeMeermaker, I have you next. Um, thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, my, my thanks to our Auditor General and to her staff. Uh, for doing this investigation, doing what they're supposed to do as an accountability office and to review the department with the goal of helping that department, helping us as elected officials do our jobs. And uh, certainly my, my first read of the report, I, I think for me was a good one because while there are I think seven recommend, main recommendations, um, there was nothing in there that surprised me, and hence my question to our senior staff, is there, are there things here that surprised you? And the answer was no. So I, I, I interpret that as this is a good report, because if there were some shocking revelations, some major either mismanagement or issues not being addressed, then we have to take some more significant corrective action. But here I think the Auditor General has confirmed what many of us know as city councillors and certainly our enforcement staff is that the old saying that we spend 90% of our time with 10% of the clients is probably true. Most people who run any type of business in the city of Toronto, any type of restaurant or a nightclub, even a massage parlor, they're legitimate business people trying to provide a service for the public. But there are those maybe 5% that cause us 95% of our grief. There are people who know our bylaws 
right from the beginning, uh, like the Auditor General said, they actually read our bylaws very carefully to figure out how to get around them, how to violate them without getting caught. Uh, they actually use our staff resources when they come into our office and they'll say to the inspector, well, if I'm breaking the law, how can I avoid breaking the law? And our staff are sort of obliged to tell them, well, you're breaking the law because you're doing one, two, three. And the bad owners will say, so if I don't do one and I don't do two and I sort of, sort of don't do three, can you, can you find me? And our officers have to say, well, no, then we wouldn't find you. Then you wouldn't be in violation. And the people who know the system skirt the rules with the help of our own staff sometimes. But I don't criticize our staff for doing that because one of the roles of our staff is to help people come into compliance. If you are an owner of a variety store or a restaurant and you um, are out of compliance, we want to bring you into compliance because 90% of the people are following the law and want to be good citizens. So I say, share the same frustration as my colleagues. Um, I differ, in my opinion, with our senior staff to some degree. I think on recommendation number seven, it talks about doing a work plan review for 2018. Uh, I actually do think we need one or two more senior researchers in the licensing department uh, because we have so many outstanding requests for reports. And when we prioritize them, I have learned that what's important to you is a priority. So we may joke and say, well, you know, microchipping your cat or your dog is not a big deal. Tell that to the mother who came to our committee and testified that her daughter's face was ripped off by a dangerous dog. That girl is scarred for life because, uh, I don't want to call it a flaw, but there is a, well, I will call it a flaw. There is an Auditor General's report about it. There is a situation where we didn't have, perhaps I'll call it the very best practice we could have had in terms of animal welfare. Uh, those animal welfare bylaws protect the animals and they protect us, the public, from dangerous animals sometimes. So, uh, you know, when we talk about rooming houses, is that a priority or not? I can tell you if, you, if you are representing somebody who lives next to a rooming house and who has those behaviors that we know that are not uh, reasonable, the, the urinating in the backyard, the garbage, the fist fights on the front lawn, the, the leering at people, the whistling and the cat calls, um, a rooming house is a really big deal to you if you happen to be living next to one. If you don't live next to one, eh, rooming houses, let's put it in a report and report back in a year to two years from now. So I do think we need some more resources. I look at the work we do and I'll just use the example of the rent safe program that we just adopted. I think that's uh, one of the most profound pieces of legislation we've done in terms of its impact on the quality of life of our friends and our neighbours. That took, I'll call it a mountain, a, a massive amount of time. So uh, when I see the importance of what we're doing, each and every one of those items, um, I, I look at the body rub parlors and people sort of you know, sometimes giggle and shrug their shoulders and I say, you know what? I actually don't get a lot of complaints about the massage parlors in my ward. Most of the men going into them don't want to be seen. They go in quietly, they lock a room, they do their business and they leave. So even in my plazas where I have a massage parlor and a daycare center just a few doors from each other, I don't get a lot of complaints. But I do know there are people working in those establishments that need the protection and the oversight that they don't have today. So I would say to our staff, and I'll, I'll conclude by saying I, I appreciate the report. It, it, it's very good for all of us to, to have this uh, sober second thought about what we're doing, but I do think our department needs some more resources to make sure we can get more reports to our committee faster. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Nunziata. Yes, uh, thank you, and thank you to staff for the report. Um, now, I, I don't know about other members of council, but the majority of complaints that come into my office are MLS issues, and that go to 311. Um, because of the garbage, because of the rooming houses, because of uh, the, the some of the illegal establishments what, that we have, the payday loans that, uh, I mean, all these issues, and so, most of the calls that come in are for MLS. And if it's necessary for council to pass a bylaw, we need to pass a bylaw. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, we need to do because um, constituents get fed up and frustrated because when there's a complaint that comes in, 
and you wait six months, seven months, a year, two years, three years, because if it's a legal rooming house, all these issues, because it c continues going to court, and the court date is delayed because they hire, even these illegal establishments, they have money to hire big time lawyers. And these lawyers go in and keep delaying the court uh, system. And it goes on and on, and it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. And we're spending so much of our resources, money, on these reinspections, on, um, and, and, and it, it just continues. Um, in my opinion, um, maybe the fines uh, the fines definitely have to be increased, and rather than the business, let's start finding the bu uh, the owner, the building owners, uh, because you know if they get hit with a huge fine, they'll be careful on who uh, who their tenants are, because a lot of them don't care, and as long as they get the rent, even if they're operating in a legal establishment, they don't care. They're getting the rent, so we have to hit maybe the owners of the of the buildings, because I think that's where you'll get a little more cooperation. Um, and I don't know if it takes that we need the province to amend that. I don't know. Whatever it takes, we need to do. Um, the reinspections, um, constantly reinspections. Um, you know, a lot of them, a lot of these um, complaints that come in, if our inspector goes out and gives them a notice, they they clean up. They clean up and they abide and and they do that. Um, but some of them don't. And those are the ones that we have, we continue to, um, to have uh, uh, problems with. We, you know, it's always been my opinion is that I, I like to be, I think we need to be aggressive, zero tolerance really, um, um, because it doesn't help and, and we're spending so much money on, on, on resources and that, you know, we're not getting, it just continues and continues. Um, you know, there are certain things that the counselors could do that our, our inspectors can't do. Uh, we can go to a problem area and we see a garage where there's prostitutes and drugs and that and we can yell at the, uh, the owner and say, you, you tear that garage down by tomorrow or I'm coming back here and, and you're going to get a huge fine. The next day I go there, the garage is demolished because they're petrified. I know w they, our inspectors can't do that because they have to be nice, but we don't have to be nice. Um, uh, it's called the integrity uh, commission. Yeah, so, and the court Perfect system, state. get rid of the court system because that's where our problem is. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think I've, I've covered all of the visitors. Um, we'll take this into committee. I have uh, Councillor Carmichael Grab. you're on the list to speak. Is there anyone else? Go ahead. Okay, I, I have a motion um, to amend uh, recommendation seven and just add as part of an overall review of the city's inspections and enforcement activities. Um, I have spoken to the chief transformation officer about this um, and he's okay with it. Um, I think because we are very siloed in this city and we do have different departments uh, that do inspections and enforcement, I know a lot of them are already looking at this, but I want to make sure that it's stated out that, that uh, the transformation officer looks at it. Um, you know, we can learn from other departments, we can use best practices, and, and even from a technology standpoint, um, uh, get on the same page about different issues, different addresses, even if there are multiple issues with a single address, we can all see what's what's going on uh, there in each division. Um, just streamline processes and, and make sure that that uh, our residents' tax dollars are, are using, being used, um, stretching as far as we can stretch them. So I'll ask for your support on this. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to speak myself very briefly. I'll just say a couple of things. First, of course, thank you to the uh, entire audit team for their work on this report. Um, I can imagine, only imagine what you went through to go through all of the details that you had to go through to get to this point. Um, but sometimes it's important to put down on paper things that either as councillors we had experienced through our dealings with our constituents or perhaps had a very informed suspicion that, uh, that were concerns. 
Um, it, it creates a, a step or a platform to take the next step. I, of course, also want to thank uh, the entire MLS department and all of the people, and the, the managers and, and frontline people that I work with as a counselor on a daily basis. Uh, because as uh, Councillor Nunziata mentioned, you know, MLS and bylaw issues are like, if it's not the top item, it's gotta be the number two item that crosses a counselor's desk. I know this, I keep track of it. And I, I call it the human division because it's all about humans and people interacting with each other in conflict and it makes it really, really sensitive. Um, the citizens of the city expect uh, there to be societal standards and they look at members of council to implement those. But how do you keep up with it with the constant piling on of issues that come up with changes to sharing economy, changes in the, the real estate market which prompts pressures on the rental system which then prompts pressures on landlords and relationships with tenants. Um, hey, we just threw backyard chickens into the mix, you know, right off the top of last council meeting. Um, so I can only just appreciate the challenges, <clears throat> pardon me, that that entire division faces with all of the demands placed on it by councillors, by society, by changing external factors. The one thing I'm, I'm not sure we can do is just keep throwing resources at it. Um, you know, it, it, it would just consume everything. I think there is a lot of hope in here because it talks about transformation and about changing the process from a very large and high level. And I, I'm really excited about that because I know how sensitive, sensitive this is to citizens. It may be quiet, um, the process that unfolds, but the outcome I think will be really, really important for how people perceive their government, how they are confident in their government and confident in their government's uh, you know, ability to follow up on those standards. And the one small remark that I'll make that I hope gets integrated in this, and speaking of building and building steps, you know, I, I, I really hope that there's a look at all of the activities that we've got in the city and, and thinking about how you integrate MLS into that process. So I think about the building department, somebody comes in with a great idea, they want to build something, um, they want to build a nightclub, maybe they want to build a holistic center. Um, that information comes across the building's department's desk and they, they do their job well. They, they go through this, they look for code standards, they deal with the fire department, they deal with planning and zoning matters and that gets all dealt with. And then <clears throat> the product is created and that, you know, maybe that takes a year or two to go through that process. Well, the product is created and there's MLS that now needs to look at it and manage it on behalf of the citizens of the city for the next hundred years. So any way that we can involve MLS into the upfront planning process in these applications and when these spaces are created and defined on a permanent basis, I think is a good thing. I don't think there's an easy answer or solution to that and I know that some of that work actually goes on right now, but um, it's my hope that there will be more of that happening. Um, and that's really just my comments on this. I think it's great work and uh, I look forward to it continuing. With that said, I believe we have an amendment and I will take a vote on that amendment. Excellent. All those in favor of the amendment on the screen, I believe that's unanimous. So item two as amended, all those in favor? Certainly recorded vote. Oh, I do. Okay, Councillor Flort, Councillor Matlow, Councillor Holiday, Councillor Carmichael Greb, and Councillor Lee. That is unanimous. Item three with no amendment. Is there any desire for a recorded vote on that, or we just go ahead? All those in favor of item number three? That's unanimous. And item number four. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you very much. We are on a AU 10.5 Toronto Building Division conditional permits. Uh, this has been held in my name for a presentation by the auditor. Just take a moment to uh, change over the people and get set up, thank you.
not adjourned. <laughs>
Issuing the first above grade permit, conditional or otherwise, is a critical milestone. This is when the amount of development charges is calculated and payable, and also the date when other fees and charges like parkland levies and education development charges become due. Minimizing development charges uh, can be a motivator for getting an above grade conditional permit as early as possible. So with this slide here, we just wanted to set some context for the scope of our review. This was not an audit. Rather, we selected a sample across all four districts covering five different managers to determine whether the hotline complaint was substantiated. In the absence of any other objective criteria in the Building Code Act and Toronto Building's own conditional permit policy, we used the draft guidelines as the benchmark by which we evaluated this sample of conditional permits. Jerry Schauble is going to take you through the findings and recommendations of the review. Thanks, Ida. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Nice to see everyone again. Uh, I'm going to take you through the findings and the recommendations. So we've broken our findings down into three different categories. First is efforts to encourage conditional permits. The second is the use of subjective versus objective permit issuance criteria. Uh, the 15 sites we reviewed paid about $30 million in development charges, and we estimate if we use the draft criteria, objective criteria, these would have been about $8 million higher. And the third category is the need to improve monitoring and, and enforcement of uh, conditional permit agreements. Uh, I would point out that the issues that we've identified are not isolated incidents. Based on the frequency, breadth, and nature of our observations indicate that the issues are systemic. Keep in mind also that five files were referred to us and there were issues in those and the other ten um, we selected on a judgment basis. Because of that mix, we didn't project our findings, so it's not uh, reasonable to assume, you know, eight out, of, eight out of 30 million projected would be the actual overall. I mean, some of those were referred to us, but what we can say is the, the issues around the controls and the, the ability to administer in a different manner is there, and, and it, it could be, you know, significant. Okay, so on issue category one relates to encouraging and expediting of conditional permits. We noted that staff prepare a list of sites that have a pending DC increase and that should be contacted. Those sites are contacted and advised that there's a pending DC increase and suggest that they may want to apply for a CP if they want to get ahead of that increase. Uh, we also noted in staff performance planners that saving developers development charges was indicated as an achievement or an accomplishment. Our recommendations in this area are not intended to slow down the development process, but rather focus on fairness and administrative consistency. We've also recommended realigning staff performance expectations to balance customer service with the city's objectives. So just a comment on that. When developers are ready for the conditional permit, it should be issued. There's, there's no doubt about that. It should not, what we're recommending here is not a slowdown in any way. If they're ready, issue it. What we're questioning is the opportunity to go to look at when developers are ready. And Jerry will have some examples. Okay, so the, our second category is the lack of objective criteria and the impact it has uh, in apparently prematurely issued conditional permits. And again, I want to stress what Ina mentioned earlier. In fairness to the division, I want to emphasize that we were using draft criteria that were not in force at the time those permits were issued. At the time of the 15 items that we reviewed, 13 of them were issued properly in accordance with the policy that was in existence at the time. Two of them were issued not in compliance with the um, Building Code Act because of some zoning deficiencies. Mm -hmm. And one of the recommendations going forward is when you have a program such as this, make sure you draft the objective criteria against which everybody is going to be measured. If there's a 15-year delay with the policy that was in place, technically, yes, in compliance, but um, in our view, it, some of the people may not have been ready, so um, it's important to have ad administrative um, criteria to, uh, to benchmark against for staff. That said, the chief building official can absolutely make the discretionary decision to issue a conditional building permit, and we recommend documenting if there's any differences between her view and the view of other divisions. So in our findings, when we look at the 15 sites that we reviewed and apply the draft criteria that the division currently has, 
we indicated that 11 of those items were issued premature, the permits were issued prematurely. And I mentioned the DC difference on those was $8 million. Uh, we can't, as the Auditor General said, we can't project potential revenue differences to the whole population because of the nature of our sample selection. But given the breadth and the totality of the um, issues that we found during the audit, we, we think that if we looked at additional permits, we would find similar issues in other permits. So this is just to give you an idea of what we're looking at. I, was, I found it helpful to have a picture of what we're looking at. So this site was issued an above grade conditional permit 16 months before this picture was taken. Uh, the, the big wall that you see is, is shoring. And you can see it's, there's still some shoring to be done on one side. Uh, this building is to have four levels of underground parking. And above grade, obviously, is the top of where the shoring is. So they, they've still got a ways to go before they get to the point where they'll need to do above grade uh, work. And the key criteria we're using in the draft policy states site construction must be at parking level one and in a construction position to proceed above grade. That's the criteria for issuing an above grade, the draft criteria for issuing an above grade permit, the point at which the DCs are set. Uh, Jerry, what was the value uh, of potential revenue that was lost on this project? I believe this one was 1.6 million. 1.6 million That's, on that one. Yes, on the first one. This one is, is different. Those, I have references to the table on the uh, picture. This is just another example. Uh, site, this uh, above grade permit was issued two years before this picture was taken and clearly nothing's happened. Uh, we don't know what the circumstances were at the time the permit was issued, but um, it doesn't appear that there are unreasonable delays. The next slide is just, if this table is recreated in a simplified form from the report, just to, so people can keep in mind the dollar values associated with what we call apparently prematurely issued above grade permits. The two that you mentioned was the second item B, and what was the other one? Item K. K. And then there was two for zoning. Sorry? There's two that were for zoning. Uh, oh, yes, the two zoning. I don't have uh, pictures of zoning. Yeah. So this, this one again is repeated from our report, and it just shows the spike in uh, permit applications and issuance immediately before a development charge increase. And those development charge increases during this period were, were quite significant. As we mentioned in the report, uh, over the five-year period, the uh, development charges increased about 71%, and it was phased in over two years on four different uh, increased dates. So the lack of, our recommendations for issue category two are for the division to move from subjective to objective con conditional permit issuance criteria improve due diligence when issuing conditional permits, and document what is being done and why. And again, just to reiterate what the Auditor General said, the Chief Building Official has the right and, and the authority to issue conditional building permits if she meets conditions under the Building Code Act, and this is not to limit or impinge on that discretion. It's merely to put some objective criteria to help staff, guide staff in when those permits should be issued. Uh, there could be instances where if these criteria, such criteria are implemented, there could be instances where the CBO decides they should still issue a permit even if the criteria aren't met, and that is her right. Our third issue category relates to monitoring enforcement of conditional permit agreements and the conditions therein. Uh, first off, our view is that if, if they enhance the due diligence around issuing permits, there'd be less of an issue around monitoring and enforcement. We noted numerous instances of conditions not being met, and in some cases, above grade permits, including permission conditions preventing below grade construction before certain uh, criteria were met, such as agreement approvals from divisions such as Toronto Water and the Toronto Transit Commission. In relation to consistency, a standard clause in most of the agreements is that construction must seriously begin within 20 days. 12 of our 15 sample items had this clause, um, but only three had an inspection around the 20-day mark to see if there was compliance with that clause. Uh, given the delays we note in the table that you saw on a previous slide, it seems that this 
its apparent this condition is not regularly met. Divisional staff advise that they're looking at this condition, they're not sure that it's the right time frame, and they're looking at revising that kind of condition. The third point here is that development charges and parkland levies are meant to be collected before a permit is issued unless there is an agreement on development charges to, con to the contrary. Uh, for, for parkland levies, that is not required by the Development Charge Act, but it is required by the Municipal Code, and the Municipal Code doesn't allow for any variation. It says they should be collected before their permit is issued, and that wasn't always the case. Our recommendations for issue category three are for the division to update their procedures and practices, be more consistent, and propose any necessary changes to the Municipal Code. To recap, we identify these three categories of issues. Moving forward, we think there's a need to balance customer service with administrative fairness and consistency. On permit issuance, the division has taken initial steps to move towards more objective criteria, but needs to finalize and implement revised measures. Finally, there's a need for consistency in monitoring and enforcement. Pressures on this front should decline with more due diligence on permit issuance. In conclusion, this report contains 17 recommendations along with management's response to each. Management agrees with our recommendations and has identified a plan to implement them. They further agree that there are concerns raised in the report that need to be addressed. And so uh, going forward, the implementation of policies that set some objective criteria for the issuance of conditional permits, the equitable, equitable treatment of applicants, and the strengthening of the monitoring and enforcement of conditional permit agreements will be addressed. We are aware that the city is in the process of conducting an end-to-end -end review of the development review process led by the Chief Transformation Officer, and our findings and recommendations would benefit from consideration during that review. I'm just gonna add one more comment, if I may. There's only two that were outside the law, two where the zoning had to be in place. The remainder would benefit from a better policy going forward. And so that, I just wanna make that distinction. It's not that all of these are, are wrong under the law. It's simply that two, two were, but the remainder um, with the objective criteria that are in place and using that on a go forward basis, uh, certainly there's more fairness and more um, DC revenue. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Matlow, you're first on the list for questions. Thank you, thank you Chair. Do, do, I, do I read this correctly, and have I heard you correctly? Are you, are you alleging that our building's staff are, when they, when, in, in some cases when they've uh, provided a uh, conditional permit, that they've considered um, the kind of revenue that the city would bring in through a DC, and that was their motivation for, for saying yes to the conditional permit? Well, what we have seen is that... That's what it sounds like. So what we have seen is that they, they make an effort to prepare a list of developers that would be affected by the DC increase, notifying those developers, landowners, of the pending increase, and indicate, basically requesting if they, if they want to apply for a CP, if they're ready to apply for a conditional permit. So there's a question for staff. Do the, does the gross amount of the development charges cover the infrastructure and servicing that the city provides when many of these developments are, are constructed? Um, what, what, is it logical to, to think that, that part of the motivation of staff for issuing these permits would be to collect the DCs? Or in fact, and this has always been my, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that in fact, in many cases, perhaps in most cases, when new buildings are constructed, it actually costs the city far, far more than any DCs would ever cover to be able to provide the necessary infrastructure, utilities, et cetera, uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to uh, service the growth? Well, I'll start off, um, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, th there's a confluence of the two things that are happening here. We've got a uh, building becomes aware of a DC uh, change and a certain date that's going to be um, enacted. And uh, so staff 
I think are required to give notice to the outstanding permit holders that that um, amount is coming and so as not to have the situation on the next day they discover something has gone up and they, they weren't aware of it. So we take an extra step to make sure people are aware of the pending changes. In the DC's calculations, uh, we calculate, and I can have Shirley uh, elaborate more fully, we calculate the amount of um, eligible costs that can be attributed to um, the number of units that we have. We come up with a calculation that forms the basis for the current and then the future changes to, to, the, to the DC bylaw. So when we go to collect, um, we uh, do it on the basis of an estimate of the number of uh, applications that we have. So it's an estimate. And uh, when that's completed, there's a review in the next bylaw. The next bylaw looks at the cost. There's some adjustments made for the estimates that were predict predictions of time I, to I'm, the action. I, I, sorry. I'm sorry, with all due respect, I'm just yeah. going to pause you there because a lot of time has been taken up, and I appreciate the, the advice that you're providing. But, but my question was really in particular about does in most cases, would, would the development charges ever cover the amount of money that actually goes out from the city to service the infrastructure needed for developments, whether it be one in particular or, or, or in general? I mean, is that, I'm just kind of trying to get there. Not so, so the answer is generally yes. The development charge scheme is calculated on in, at intervals, and those intervals take into account all the changes that have occurred in the past period and look at the projections into the- Cover the necessary infrastructure? According to the Act, I mean, according to what's eligible, yes. It's, I find that surprising. Through, through the chair, actually, it, there's a 10% discount. There are certain things in the Act so that the, the costs don't cover, or the development charges don't cover all of the costs. That's, yeah. And we're certainly working to try and get uh, regulatory change to increase that. Yeah, I would have been surprised if that were true. I, I, a question for Mr. Andalucci. Um, would you, would you mind, I, I just want to provide you with an opportunity to comment on some of the comments that were made before with respect to the, uh, the premature uh, conditional permits issued or any other matter, whoever would like, sorry, excuse me, whoever would like to respond to that. It's the last question though, thank you. Through the chair, what I can tell you is that when staff are making decisions to issue a conditional permit, the staff are looking at, so, the Auditor General has recognized that the permits that she reviewed on the policy that was in place at the time, that that was followed appropriately with the exception of two where there may have been an issue with respect to zoning. But what I can tell you is that when staff are making that decision, they're looking at the requirements of the Act and they're asking the developer to actually give their reasons as to why they need um, their development or need their bill or conditional permits so that we can issue it. And all of that information is taken into account for the chief billing official to make her decision. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the committee? I have uh, a couple, if I may. Um, to the DCM, in the earlier response, um, the DCM had mentioned that there was a required notice with respect to changes or step ups that council approves in the DCs. I wondered if you could elaborate on what the what the requirement is for the notice. Courtesy that uh, we offer to the people that we're dealing with, we want to make sure that uh, there's, some, there's some awareness. Sometimes people don't properly uh, follow the minutes of council, et cetera. Is it provided from a customer service perspective or is it provided from a statutory perspective? It's provided from a customer service uh, perspective, Mr. Kim. Are there any forms or templates or letters that an applicant signs uh, when they submit an application that would be appropriate to mark right on them, these are the scheduled DC changes uh, that we know about, at least in, in, in that have been approved, or does that already exist? Can we build it right on the form? Um, to you, Mr. Chair, um, the form doesn't specifically 
address that. But what you will see in the report that management has looked at, what's a way that we can actually have administrative fairness so that we can let all of the applicants know of these changes. And so moving forward, what we're looking at is for opportunities to provide that notice in a consistent and fair way. My next question is to the auditor and the auditor team. Um, I found that there's a, there's a difference between um, being proactive from a customer service perspective and going further than that and actually soliciting people to submit an application for um, a, a conditional permit. Did your team have a specific finding on that or is it just I, I took there were some sample emails I think in here that just basically looked to me a lot like customer service that informing the team that there's something coming along to keep an eye on your files that type of stuff did you find anyone went further than that uh, and stepped into that category of actually really going out there and reaching out and uh, encouraging people um, what I can say is it's an uneven practice and I think buildings is comfortable making sure that it's consistent across the board is um, you know I, I the, I'm sure that staff are working to try to make sure the development community is, uh, is, uh, is needs are addressed and the city's needs are addressed. Uh, but we uh, saw opportunities to clarify um, what's important and to make sure fairness is there. We did see in some performance appraisals, you know, reducing DC increase, reducing DC impact on developers to be important and, and, and it might be, but we have to align things with the city's um, requirements of administrative fairness and also um, to make sure the needs of the uh, fees come in, you know, the, the revenue comes in. Okay. So. And I guess the last question is in, in looking, there's a chart in the report that shows the, the spike in activity just prior to a DC change and it, it no surprise, right? The, applicants are going to make a, a mad dash for the finish line because this is a significant amount of money. It's got to have a logjam impact on city staff. And when you, when you crush everything into a small amount of time and space, uh, it's got to be much harder for, um, for city staff teams to, to manage these, to make sure everything is just perfect. Um, are you confident that some of the, um, the findings and recommendations of the auditor might go so far as to help you manage um, workload and gating so that you actually smooth those curves out a little bit and you end up with better productivity, I think? Uh, to the chair once again, um, what you will see in the report is that management has agreed with the recommendation of the auditor to look at ways to actually mitigate that issue. What I would like to say though is that whenever there's any regulatory change, that is typical, it's typical in any regulatory change that you will see an influx of applications at that time. So seeing them with respect to development charges increase isn't a surprise to us, but moving forward what we will be looking at is are there opportunities for us to manage that in a way that could help. Thank you. Are there any speakers on this item? Councillor Carmichael Greb. Thank you, I have a uh, motion. City Council direct that a copy of the Auditor General's report headed Toronto Building Division conditional permits be forwarded to the Chief Transformation Officer with a request that he consider the report as part of the end-to-end -end review of the development review process. Um, so this is something that he is chairing uh, the working group for the end-to-end -end review and um, as was suggested, uh, during the presentation that this be forwarded to him uh, to consider. Thanks very much. Um, are there any other speakers to the item? Seeing none, um, we will uh, consider this amendment here. Everyone's comfortable with it. All those in favor? I take that as unanimous. The item is amended. All those in favor? I take that as unanimous. So we've got nine minutes left. Um, I'll put it to the committee. If you would like to hear the auditor's presentation, we might be squeezing it in pretty tight on nine minutes. Budget. We'd have to, we'd have to, the budget presentation, or if you would uh, prefer to have an extra eight minutes at this point on, uh, on the lunch break, if that's, you're comfortable with that, I think we should break.
with agreement, great. So uh, we are going to break till 1.30. Thank you.